Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. This is a very special edition. I am in the cave of Peter Atia, Dr. Peter Atia, and we'll get back to his bio in a second. We have the incredible videographer who is trapped inside a closet to monitor levels. Everything has been fitted to perfection, and that'll all make sense shortly. Dr. Peter Atia, who can be found at peteratia, A-T-T-I-A-M-D.com, is a former ultra-endurance athlete, so imagine swimming races of 25 or so miles, maybe more, a compulsive self-experimenter, emphasis on compulsive, and one of the most fascinating human beings I know. He is one of my go-to doctors, I would say the go-to doctor for me, for anything performance or longevity related. But here's the official bio to do him some justice. Peter is a physician focusing on the applied science of longevity. His practice deals extensively with nutritional interventions, exercise physiology, sleep physiology, emotional and mental health, and pharmacology to increase lifespan, that is how long you live, while simultaneously improving health span. In other words, how well you live. Peter trained for five years at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in General Surgery, where he was the recipient of several prestigious awards, including Resident of the Year and the author of a comprehensive review of general surgery. He also spent two years at NIH as a surgical oncology fellow at the National Cancer Institute, where his research focused on immune-based therapies for melanoma. He has since been mentored by some of the most experienced and innovative lipidologists, endocrinologists, gynecologists, sleep physiologists, and longevity scientists in the United States and Canada. Peter earned his MD from Stanford University and holds a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering and Applied Mathematics. Peter also hosts The Drive, a weekly deep dive podcast, and I do mean deep dive, focusing on maximizing longevity and all that goes into that, including physical, cognitive, and emotional health. It features topics including fasting, ketosis, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, mental health, and much more. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find him all over the interwebs, peteratiamd.com, on Twitter, at peteratiamd, Instagram, same, same, peteratiamd, Facebook, you got it, peteratiamd, and then on YouTube, peteratiamd. Peter, welcome back to the show. Wow. That was, that was quite an intro. <laughs> it was an incredibly comprehensive. I could have shown intro. up a little later for this. <laughs> <laughs> so we've we've uh, we've had frequent flyer miles uh, on on podcasts, including on this show. And last time we used a format that I quite enjoyed, in part because it required minimal preparation for me, and that was going through categories, excited about changed mind about and stupid things or absurd things that you do. And I know that you have a number of things that you are excited about. Uh, so we may spend more time in that category. Uh, so why don't you kick us off? Well, um, so yes. Yeah, so, so the nice thing about this is I get to prepare a little bit and I jotted down a few bullet points on each. So, um, I think one of the things I'm really excited about is a very recent thing in, in that it's come to market really recently. It's been in the works for about five years and it's something called a liquid biopsy. Um, and the reason this is interesting is that when you think about the sort of major chronic diseases, which is the diseases of atherosclerosis, so heart disease, stroke, uh, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease, we don't have a lot of great tools at detecting cancer early. Uh, so cancer screening is a somewhat controversial topic. Most people are probably familiar with things like mammograms, colonoscopies, and PSA testing. Um, there are two or three others that um, rise to the level of having evidence to suggest that we do them, for example, pap smears. Um, but when it comes to some of the really bad actors of cancer, we don't really have great screening tools. And so what a liquid biopsy does is it draws a sample of blood and through that, tries to predict whether or not you have cancer cells in your body and tries to do so of course when you have very very few of them because the evidence is overwhelming that all things being equal a cancer when caught early at an early stage is imminently more curable than a cancer caught at a later stage and probably the most compelling um, explanation for that is that the longer a cancer gets to fester in your body the more chance it has to develop mutations and the more mutations it generates the more difficult it is to target later on so there are a number of companies that have been doing this, but to me, the most interesting by far is a company called Grail um, because of the method that they've gone about doing this. And the method is using something called cell-free DNA as opposed to tumor DNA. And just for 
those listening grail as in holy grail the exactly <laughs> coming out big um as a little side note grail was recently acquired by another company called illumina illumina being the largest company that does dna sequencing and a very interesting note is the ftc has sued illumina uh, for antitrust violations in this acquisition, which if you understand the science of it, and we don't have to get into it in great detail, um, is literally the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So that the FTC has done this, in my opinion, is actually a tragedy because it is actually going to cost um, lives. It's going to cost tens of thousands of lives in delay if this um, acquisition does not go through because Illumina has the power to scale this up like no other company would. Putting that aside for a moment, um, what is, what is cell-free DNA? Because that's really at the heart of this technology. Say that one more time. What is cell-free DNA? Cell-free like DNA. C-E-L-L -L hyphen yep. free. Yeah, as in DNA that's not in a cell. So most of the DNA in your body is contained within cells. Um, but when a cell breaks down, or sometimes even when cells spontaneously, like red blood cells, or actually typically monocytes, white blood cells, make DNA and then spontaneously like release it from them, you can capture these small amounts of cell-free DNA. So if you draw somebody's blood, whether or not they have cancer or not, they're gonna have a certain amount of this cell-free DNA floating around. You have signatures on DNA called methylations. A methyl group is just a carbon with three hydrogens on it. It's one of the most basic building blocks of organic chemistry. And as DNA acquires these signatures, so remember DNA is made up of these four nucleotides, when they start binding these little methyl That's groups. That's the ACTG. Exactly, mm -hmm. ACTG. As they start acquiring these methyl groups, that tells a bit of a story. And even though there's not a lot of cell-free DNA, um, when you look at it, the best analogy, and one of my analysts actually came up with this analogy, is it's sort of like looking at, you know, meteor fragments that would land in the desert and being able to understand what type of an asteroid they came from. Mm -hmm. So even though the asteroid is enormous and it shed like big ch chunks of meteor down to Earth, and by the time they actually hit the Earth, they're just small rocks, a chemical analysis of that would give you a greater idea where it came from. So this type of test can actually de detect up to 50 different types of cancers. There are certain ones that it's not very good at detecting, such as prostate cancer, um, which is not bad because we have other tools that are so good at detecting prostate cancer. Um, but when you do this blood test, you basically get a readout which says no cancer detected or the following have been detected. And it does this with about a 50% sensitivity and about a 97 to 99% specificity. Now, to explain what that means in context requires a little bit of math, and it's worth going into. So sensitivity is the probability that a cancer is truly there if detected by the test, and specificity is, a prob is the probability that the cancer is not there if not detected by the test. So sensitivity speaks to true positives, and specificity speaks to true negatives. Now at first, 50% sensitivity doesn't sound that good, but you have to remember it depends on what we call the pretest probability is. So pretest probability says, what is the probability that you have cancer before I test you? And that's a function of many things. It's a function of the prevalence of that cancer. It's a, it's a function of your age. It's a function of other behaviors. So for example, two people being otherwise identical except one being a smoker and one not being a smoker are gonna have very different pretest probabilities. But when you start to think about, <clears throat> for example, you, what's your pretest probability of having pancreatic cancer? It's quite low, fortunately, even though pancreatic cancer is one of the most lethal cancers out there. So in a low probability environment, a modest sensitivity of 50% and a very high uh, specificity produces incredible what we call positive and negative predictive value. So what do those things mean? So positive predictive value, as it sounds, means what's the probability that if you get a positive test, you truly have cancer? A negative predictive value is, of course, if you have a negative test, what's the probability it's negative? These numbers end up being well north of 90%. In fact, the negative predictive value is about 99.7%. The positive predictive value is in the ballpark of about 97%. So these are really exciting tests, especially when you pair them with some of the other things that we do in our practice, such as relying on a very special type of MRI technology that uses something called diffusion-weighted imaging that adds sort of a functional dimension to MRI. 
quick note there. People can, if they really want to deep dive into that subject matter, you have a guest on your podcast. And I've, I've listened to this episode. It get, does get quite technical. But That's right. What is the guest's name for people who want to, want to search? Raj, R-A-J. Uh, and how do you spell his last name? A-T-T-R-A-A-W-A-L. Of course, I can't spell in my head. But if you just search Raj MRI, it'll, it'll pop up. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, yes, that's, that's an episode we usually make our patients listen to before they go and get one of those MRIs so they understand it. Follow up to that, un- unrelated but uh, related to Grail, what is it that happened or what technology was developed that suddenly made this possible where it was not possible before? Or what realization? Why did this suddenly come to fruition? Or, it, or, or only now become available? It, I, I think the major insight, and I will be doing a podcast on this, but I need to wait until this FTC issue is resolved a little bit because the person that I really want to interview for the podcast, who is one of the people that had the biggest hand in developing this, um, is actually now the chief scientific officer at Illumina. And so for him to be able to speak about it, obviously it would need to make sense that Illumina actually owns the technology again. I would say, and this might change as I get deeper into understanding their journey, I think it was the realization that tumor tumor DNA was not the place to go. So at the outset of this process, people didn't know what to look for. Would you look for RNA of tumors? Because RNA is the, you know, it's the template that's telling you to make the protein. And that didn't really pan out because RNA is so unstable by itself. So then pivoting to DNA, the logical choice was, well, let's look for the tumor DNA. You know, if you have pancreatic cancer and we can find the DNA of a pancreatic cancer cell, that would be a good place to start. But you're, you have to be looking for cell-free DNA by definition when you're doing a liquid biopsy because you're not going to sample the organ. And it turns out that tumor DNA represents about 0.1% of cell-free DNA. So I think the big aha for Grail was realizing, no, let's look at cell-free DNA, which is much more abundant, but instead look at the methylation patterns and then specifically figure out what those methylation patterns were. So that was the real puzzle. Yeah, the, the forensic science. Yep. That's very cool. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, I interrupted a train of thought that uh, had more to say about Grail. Do you want to, to say more about Grail or do you want to hop to another? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I just think that this is, you know, I, I'm... I have been waiting for this, like I said, for five years, um, because I think that I'm just less bullish on the idea that we're going to quote unquote cure cancer, right? If you put cancer in perspective, the overall survival for people with metastatic cancer has improved about 5% in 50 years. And virtually all of that improvement has come with a handful of very specific types of cancers. Um, so for example, something called the GI stromal tumor, um, and a certain type of testicular cancer for which there's been like, you know, very specific behaviors of these that have rendered them quite sensitive to, to certain chemotherapies. But when it comes to, you know, lung cancer, when it comes to pancreatic cancer, when it comes to colon cancer, breast cancer, once you don't catch it early, you're sort of in the same situation you were in, in about 1970. Uh, and that's, that's pretty depressing when you consider how much progress has been made in cardiovascular disease since that time. So I think the answer in how do you live longer with respect to cancer is prevention, is prevention first and, well, it, it's both, right? It's so what can we do to prevent cancer and not smoking and being metabolically healthy are hands down the two biggest things that you can do. And then the next step is how aggressively can you screen and stack different levels of screening technologies on top of each other? So that, you know, the way we kind of describe it to patients is you want to think of like the Swiss cheese approach, right? You want to be able to stack a whole bunch of things on top of themselves so that you just get only one pencil can fit through. Yeah. Each, each method or technology in and of itself having gaps, but That's right. when you lay them on top of each other, hopefully the, 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 the remaining gaps are sort of allowable, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And, yeah. and it's exactly that. It's basically how do you use multiple technologies to cover the blind spots of others? I'm excited about Grail also because it seems like, especially if scaled through Illumina, the ability to have Grail widely distributed uh, makes it just by definition more available, at least as one tool 
compared to, say, the MRI that we were referring to right. earlier, which would appear to be site-specific. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, MRI is going to be far less scalable um, and, the, and, and, frankly, far more of a hassle. I mean, if you've, I don't know if you've ever had, well, you haven't had one yet. We got to get you up there. Yeah, I've had, <laughs> for better and for worse, probably quite a few MRIs, uh, not always in ideal circumstances, yeah. but this particular MRI, not yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's like, how do you drive the cost down? How do you improve the technology? How do you make the algorithm better and better and better? Because it is, under, under all of this, is a huge engine of machine learning mm. that makes it better over time. So you mentioned, in terms of prevention, metabolically healthy. Is there anything you're excited about or would like to underscore that relates to developing metabolic health or improving metabolic health? Always. Um, I'd say, you know, exercise is so important, right? It, it can't be overstated. It's potentially one of the most potent drugs we have. But all exercise is not created equal, I would imagine. Correct. For and this purpose. Ab absolutely. Um, and so I, I think of exercise as having four pillars. And um, you have to be strong on each of those. So if you're strong in three but not in one, it's sort of like a table that has three legs and not one. It's still a reasonable table, but it's not as strong as a table with four legs. And a table with two legs is pretty pathetic. And obviously a table with one leg is not a table. <laughs> so... The four pillars are stability, strength, aerobic efficiency, and anaerobic performance. And I think that most people understand loosely what three of those are. Could you say those all one more time? Sure. Stability. Mm -hmm. That's the one that most people don't understand. We can talk about that in a minute. Strength, mm -hmm. aerobic efficiency, and anaerobic performance. Got so. It. I guess we can unpack all of them, but stability is the ability to safely transfer load from the outside world to the body and vice versa, which sounds sort of like a, I don't know, kind of a, a soft ex explanation. Um, an analogy that I really like using is that of a race car versus a street car. So what makes race cars so unique is that and why by the way a race car that's got half the power of a street car will still knock its socks off on a track is because the chassis and the tires of the race car are constructed in such a way that every bit of that power is making it to the road so the analogy i like to think of is that the tires of a race car are like our feet and stability really does begin with the feet and most people myself included when i was starting had horrible proprioception with our feet um you know, we don't really know how to load our feet correctly. And a lot of that comes from the fact that we wear shoes all day. Um, your hands and your feet are actually very similar. And if you think about what you can do with your hands, how easily you can move them around, spread your fingers, sense d pressure in different areas, most people can't do that with their feet. And that, that comes, to, comes to bite you. So um, as you think about how it moves up the, the sort of chain, um, a very common problem is uh, a, the which I think accounts for probably more of the injuries that people experience is this pattern where the pelvis is tilted forward, the ribs are flared up, the erector spinae muscles in the back are sort of locked short, meaning they're locked like they they're locked in concentric load, and the hamstrings are locked long, so they're locked yeah. in eccentric load. Yeah. It's how someone who's quite lean from a body fat perspective can still look like they have a pot belly. That's right. With that anterior pelvic tilt. Which actually, so, so you've asked me a question, and I think that I can answer this with, there are really two things I'm excited about that pertain to exercise. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go down up. this path, and then we'll come back to the other one. Um, so what's the, what's the etiology of that position, which I was the king of that position? Um, it's probably... What do you mean by etiology? Like, where did, what drives that? Why would mm -hmm. a person show up with that posture of mm -hmm. ribs flared up, pelvis tilted forward, back tight, hamstrings tight and long? Besides wearing six-inch stiletto heels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. which I never wore. I mean, I wore them sometimes, but I don't often wear them. You're in good company. J. Yeah. Edgar Hoover and all. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> so it probably starts with lousy respiration. And, and I'm not exactly sure why that's the case, but... I, I think somewhere along the way, we stop learning or we stop breathing correctly into our abdomen. 
right? So we, instead of breathing the way we should breathe, which is the diaphragm should go down, the abdomen should come out, the pelvis should actually fill with pressure. We tend to breathe using, so that's the, those are the primary muscles of respiration as the diaphragm. We start using accessory muscles like the pec and the pec minor, and we kind of lift the chest up. This is a very common pattern of respiration. And I think it's that lifting of the chest that is what's bringing the rib cage up. And when that happens, the body is a little bit out of balance, uh, meaning your center of mass shifts forward. And the body senses that, and in an effort to prevent you from falling forward, it's basically tightening those erector spinae muscles. It's, it's pulling you into balance again. But in doing so, it's creating this downstream problem in the hamstrings, which is they're just, they're locking. And if there's another thing I've become really obsessed with, it's hamstring control, which is different from hamstring strength. Um, a lot of people, myself included, can have very strong hamstrings. I used to have incredibly strong hamstrings if you put me on a machine and made me do something in isolation, but I could never recruit them. So uh, a simple exercise to demonstrate this, which Beth Lewis had me do for the first time maybe two and a half or three years ago, was you laying on your back with your knees up and your feet down. So you're sort of in a back position, knees up, you know, feet on the surface of the ground. And without letting your back tilt into a huge, you know, make a huge dome underneath it. So while keeping your lower, lower back, back flat, can you with one leg pull very, very hard back to your butt and feel your hamstring tense? So that is a very specific manner of recruiting hamstring strength. And believe it or not, I couldn't do that, with that while keeping my back down. My back, I would arch like a cat if I tried to do that. There were many more of these types of exercises, but it was through this type of very deliberate, you know, starting on my back and then learning to do hamstring recruitment while standing and while feeling pressure in my feet that really allowed me to get back to deadlifting with a feeling of safety that I'd never really experienced. Cause I used to deadlift so heavy when I was young and basically got away with using my back to deadlift, which is obviously not what you want to do. And then I just started having nagging injuries as I got older. So by the time I was in my mid forties, I'm deadlifting and it's like, oh, my SI joint would bug me. And after I'd finish, my back would just feel tight. Um, so it's it sort of, you know, what age sort of uh, exposes your deficiencies and eventually everybody's going to sort of pay a price for this. Some people do these things naturally better than others. So I think there are some people who can kind of go their entire life lifting heavy weights without having to pay much attention to this stuff. But, you know, I certainly wasn't one of them. Does that type of training that you're describing, that progression kind of starting back from the foundation or the fundamentals, does that have a particular name? The, there are a couple different schools of thought that have been implemented into this training, one of them being dynamic neuromuscular stabilization or DNS, which is heavily focused on this ability to find the breath and generate uh, you know, this concentric abdominal pressure. So creating a cylinder inside the abdomen as opposed to like an upside down triangle where you have some pressure up here but none down here. And then another school of thought that's been heavily influential here has been something called Postural Restoration Institute or PRI. And that's, that's really the one that has focused on this idea of how do you correct what from the side looks like this, right? You know, sort of pelvis down, ribs up, and how do you fix that position? And, and um, again, it's, it's, it's hard because it requires fixing everything from the feet to the neck. Hmm. How much of a contributor, if at all, do you think extended sitting is to that configuration with the kind of flared ribs up and anterior pelvic tilt, if any? I think it probably is, um, and, and probably for a couple of reasons. You have to sort of think about it as the positive and the negative, right? So one drawback of sitting is that you're not active. So it's, it's simply the removal of active time that is a problem. And I think the other problem with sitting is it is simply harder to generate um, intra-abdominal pressure, and it's easier to just rely on these accessory movements of respiration to lift up. So, you know, I, if I think I've said this once before, like if I could be czar for a day, you know, I'd go back to kids when they're in school and, you know, have them in standing desks or squatting 
those would be your two positions, right? So you either, you're kind of squatting to do work or you're standing to do work, but you're not sitting in the types of chairs that we sit in. I think I have an idea for a uh, complimentary short form podcast for you, which is just called Czar for a Day. <laughs> <laughs> five minute, <laughs> five minute commandments from Czar Atia. Yep. Uh, and more, more barefoot time. That's another thing, right? You know, with my first two kids, I wasn't so aware of this when they were young. And now with my youngest, who's almost four, like I study this guy like he's like the master. His, his movement patterns are simply unbelievable, which of course all four-year-olds should be. I just never noticed it before. But the manner in which he moves and lifts himself and reaches for things and sits around, it's incredible. It is it is such a spectacle to behold. Uh, so, you know, if, if you if you spend more time watching your children and that's, you know, DNS is is modeled on exactly that. Right. DNS basically says it, it grew out of um, something called the Prague School in Czechoslovakia, which was originally um, looking at ways to take children with cerebral palsy and teach them how to move again by realizing that what CP had robbed them of was a lot of the developmental movement patterns that occur in the first two years of life. And once they started to realize you could actually take these kids and retrain their neurologic system to do things in a more functional way, that you could actually do this as a form of rehab and then ultimately a form of prehab, which is mm. sort of how I like to think of it now. So, I've seen, uh, I don't know how much of this is public, but incredible results from a, a trainer also world record holder or former world record holder in olympic weightlifting jersey gregorek working with a number of uh, clients or patients with cerebral palsy using very incremental uh, movement rehabilitation and training i mean the 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 before and after differences are staggering and it's 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 i mean i speaks to probably my ignorance of cerebral palsy but just never was even within my like conceptual schema that that would be possible it's very exciting to to see so um speaking of exciting oh so the other thing on exercise to get back to your question about the metabolic stuff is you know, about three years ago, I was becoming more and more interested in this idea of zone two training, uh, which has a very technical definition, and then we can explain proxies for it. But the definition of zone two is the highest level of output you can produce while keeping lactate below two millimole. So mm -hmm. um, lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. So when we're sitting here at rest, our lactate level is probably one if we're metabolically healthy. There are some people who sit around at rest higher than two. Um, but if anybody's done lactate testing knows, you know, as you start exerting yourself more and more, your lactate will rise. And you know, peak levels in highly trained individuals can reach above 20 millimole. And that's accompanied by remarkable discomfort actually. So um, I've always done lactate training when I was, you know, being an athlete, which I haven't been in forever. Um, but I was never focused on this aspect of it. I was always focused on something called lactate threshold and peak lactate. So peak lactate for me was kind of a marker of just how much pain I could endure. And lactate threshold was a marker of the highest amount of output I could produce, um, for relatively short races. Um, like, you know, meaning short for me would be like half an hour or something like that. So knowing my lactate threshold was important for that stuff. But this zone two stuff is way below that, right? Zone two is by definition your all day pace. It's basically at a lactate level of two, you should be able to go all day because that's the, that's the level at which you do not net accumulate. So you're producing, but you're not right. accumulating. And so it's the rate at which clearance equals production and you stay at that level of two. So does that training fall into the aerobic efficiency category? Yes, exactly. Just a very quick note to say that we really nerded out on zone two training with Peter. We got deep into the rabbit hole. It got very, very dense, also actionable, but I moved that section to the end of the episode. So if you want to check that out later, just continue listening. Now back to the show. So you mentioned fat utilization or the ability to use fat as a, as a substrate. 
are there things, and specifically what's coming to my mind, such as fasting or intermittent ketosis that help you to use fat in such a way that it transfers to zone two training? Is there any crossover, I suppose? Yeah, well, there's no question that, you know, ketosis by its very definition is a nutritional state that forces your body to utilize fat. Um, and depending on how much you're intaking, some of that fat could be endogenous. So again, exogenous is the fat that you put in your body. So what fat you eat is exogenous. The fat stores that we have are endogenous. There's a bit of a, I think, just a misunderstanding around ketosis. I think a lot of people assume it is automatically a weight loss diet or a fat loss diet, but of course that's not necessarily true. It's only a fat loss diet if you use your endogenous fat stores. Also turns out a pound of fat has a lot of calories. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I could gain weight on a ketogenic diet if I ate enough, right? Now, the, the advantage of ketogenic diets for most people is that they're quite satiating and you don't want to eat endless amounts uh, in the way that if you went on the all Dorito diet, which I've also pioneered, <laughs> I've got experience with the all Dorito <laughs> diet, and it uh, turns out you can eat a lot. <laughs> Uh, the all licorice. I used to work at a video store when I was in high school called movies and munchies. <laughs> and you know, it was owned by my it's, friends, it's a video store plus dispensary. Yeah. And they didn't, they just didn't care how much I ate. Yeah. And I would literally eat the pound of Twizzlers. Like, you know, they came in that pound, maybe okay. a pound and a half. It was, it was like huge. the biggest bag of Twizzlers. You could like, take out like a mugger with this bag of Twizzlers. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Like it's a weapon. <laughs> and if, if any reasonable group of four people went to a movie, they'd have a hard time finishing one. But I would easily throw that down plus the really big bags of Doritos plus a really big bag of popcorn plus God knows what else. Like that was routine <laughs> For the night <laughs> just disgusting <laughs> easily four or five thousand calories of junk food three nights a week was my staple so if we look at the opposite of that fasting has you have you changed your mind or had uh any insights since we last spoke or come to any different conclusions related to fasting yeah i mean i think because you've done i mean for the record you've done you've done a lot of fasting i mean you have a lot of experience doing Right. fasts of many different lengths including i don't know what the longest fast is that you've done what would probably you say? 10 days 10 days yeah. yeah um yeah i think that you know one thing that i absolutely learned through fasting uh is the the, uh, the enormous importance of strength training throughout a fast it's very easy you're going to lose muscle mass when you fast you have to accept that so the question is how do you minimize that damage how do you lose as little muscle mass as possible and um, strength training daily during a fast has become an important part of that. But when you look at time-restricted feeding, which is, or people call it intermittent fasting, although I don't, I don't like that term very much. I think time-restricted makes more sense when you're just talking about you know, 16 or 18 hours. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really starting to see a lot of people who do that excessively and who aren't necessarily training correctly. They lose weight, but they're losing muscle more than they would want to see. And, you know, we just had a patient who we did a DEXA scan on last week. Um, and it was probably the first one we've done in 18 months on him. And in that 18 month period, his body weight had not changed. Maybe he was a bit lighter, actually he might've lost four pounds, but his body fat was so high. I almost fell off my chair and he doesn't look chubby right? But he's, he's it's, it speaks to how much muscle he's lost. So he, his body fat went from about 18% to 30%. Yikes. Which was, you know, it's just a totally unacceptable amount of fat for someone his age. Um, and, and his visceral fat went up, which I actually care more about than body fat. We can talk about that later. Um, but his visceral fat also went up. So, you know, this is a guy who has religiously been doing his time restricted feeding every day, but he doesn't really lift weights. You know, he, he walks and, you know, does some yoga and stuff like that, but he's not doing strength training. So I think in a person like that, there, there's a real downside to too much time restricted feeding. And even for myself, like in the last four or five months, I've been, I, I, you know, I did a DEXA back in January and I hadn't done one in years. And from the, from January to the last period that I had done a DEXA, my body weight was 
almost identical. Maybe I was two pounds lighter this year versus the last time, but my body fat was up. I think I went from 10 to 16% body fat. Um, and again, you could say, well, 16 is not the end of the world, but you know, that was a significant loss of muscle and gain of fat. Um, and I, I did wonder if that was just too much because, because I always exercise in the morning, but then don't eat. So you, you know, to exercise and then not provide yourself with, especially with when you're strength training to provide yourself with any amino acids every single day to, you know, undergo muscle protein synthesis, I think is a little bit risky. So, I, so I've been looking at other strategies around that, right? So for example, front loading quick, the meals. Quick question when, and then we'll come back to front loading meals during that period of time were you doing and i this i may be misremembering but one one three day fast a month or one week long fast every quarter what was the frequency all of, of the above yeah I, I probably spent maybe two years doing seven days a quarter maybe a year doing of three days a month um and then but in between it's also doing lots of time restricted mm -hmm. um and honestly i think the daily time restricted was a bit more the issue because yeah. I think you can, you relatively, you can, rel, you know, I, I think the three day fast a month with a lot of lifting, I didn't sense I lost a lot of muscle mm. during that period of time. But I think every day exercising in the morning, not putting calories in until later in the day, um, it, it has to be, it, it has to be taken in the context of an individual. So if you're someone who's a hundred pounds overweight or you have diabetes, it's a totally worthwhile trade off to lose muscle mass because you're losing more fat mass along the way, yeah. right? So you are going to technically get leaner with that approach. But when you take a relatively healthy and lean individual, um, you, one has to be a little bit careful and look for alternative ways to sort of get the benefits of that fast. So you were saying something about front-loading meals? Yeah, so I just find nowadays, uh, although probably not tonight, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna eat- a, Almost certainly not tonight. Uh, I'm gonna eat a little bit more early in the day and a little less late in the day. So I'm gonna- <laughs> There may or may not be some mezcal involved. <laughs> so, uh, there will be. So we won't, we won't take either of our aura ring data as the standard for this evening. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I totally got caught up in my own fantasy Fantasies narrative. about mezcal. <laughs> so front loading meals, could you just walk back and explain? In an ideal thing? world, I think that the best way to do time-restricted eating would be to eat a big breakfast. So it would be to wake up, exercise, eat a huge breakfast. By huge, I don't mean gluttonous, but I mean that's your biggest meal of the day at say, I don't know, like, let's just put some numbers to it. You wake up at six, you work out from seven to 8.30. At nine o'clock, you're eating your largest meal. You eat another meal at one o'clock that is modest and you don't eat again. That would be a great way to do 16 hours of not eating a day. Um, that's problematic for two reasons. The first is it's socially problematic. It's really easy to not have breakfast because very few people eat breakfast with other people, but dinner is our social meal. And for obvious reasons, it just poses a difficulty to be the guy who never eats dinner. Um, the other I've been, just as a side note, I've been at multiple dinners now, <laughs> quite a few actually, where you've been fasting and we've all been sitting drinking wine and you just like pass the cheesecake at the end and you take a big whiff and then continue moving it along. It's entertaining, but it is pretty antisocial yeah. to be that guy. To be that guy. Um, yeah. To, drinking the soda water. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is I think for many people, it is hard to go to bed hungry. Mm. Um, and truthfully, in longer fasts, it gets easier because, you know, if you're fasting for seven days, by the time you hit that fifth day, you're, a lot of your hunger has sort of dissipated. But 16 hours of not eating can generally pose some hunger. And, and for some reason, I just think psychologically in the evening, we're a little less busy. So it's even more noticeable. Um, whereas if you're doing the traditional way that people think about not eating for 16 hours, it's pretty easy to wrap yourself up in work in the morning, skip breakfast and kind of delay your lunch a little bit. Mm. So, you know, I don't know that I have a great answer for that other than I think people should be a little cautious and not just apply the same hammer uh, to, to every nail and kind of think about their own physiology a little bit and, and rely on these, 
you know, technologies like DEXA to make sure, yeah. which again is so so readily available, so relatively inexpensive, um, and and provides both good information about body composition and also this thing of visceral fat. That yeah. Well, let's we'll come to the visceral fat uh, in just a second. Uh, on the DEXA note, about I don't what know a year and a half or two years ago, uh, I recall a conversation with a DEXA technician who said to me, over the last 12 months, I've seen many cases of people coming in who are newly avowed intermittent fasters who have had their body composition flip, basically. I mean, like, not necessarily flip, but the, uh, they've had massive jumps in the percentage body fat. And I, I put that on social as a as a note, not to, in, not to say that all people who do time-restricted feeding experience this, and it was uh, hilarious and also uh, frustrating to see how many religious zealots there are around intermittent fasting who were just like, <laughs> bite thy tongue, you know? Bite. Wait, wait, but you said that, according to this tech, that they got better intermittent fasting or worse? No, they got worse. They, oh, they got worse. They, 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 there were so many, it, it, met, it met with what I'm describing. It's exactly, it's exactly compatible with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was a lot of resistance to the idea that that would even be possible, right? Uh, which, I, which I found really interesting, more social commentary than anything else. Um, and and I, I think it just speaks to sort of why I don't like talking about nutrition very much because it it does lend itself to politics, not literally, but it's sort of the politics religion ethos, which is whatever you're eating is obviously the only thing. And um, I guess I just encourage people to be much more attuned to all of the tools, right? So caloric restriction, dietary restriction, time restriction, right? You've probably heard me go on and on about my framework, the three levers. Um, always pull one, sometimes pull two, occasionally pull three, never pull none. So time restriction, what we're talking about, restricting when you eat, but otherwise not restricting how much or what. Dietary restriction uh, is restricting some of like, some of the content in what you eat. So not eating carbs, not eating wheat, not eating meat, not something eating like Doritos, that. right? <laughs> um, not eating sugar. Those are all forms of dietary restriction. Um, and then caloric restriction is restricting the amount. And so if you are never pulling one of those levers, which means you're eating as much as you want, whenever you want of, of, you know, whatever, anything you want, anytime, how much, whatever that's called the standard American diet. Sad. <laughs> yeah. The sad. <laughs> and we've been running a very good natural experiment on that for 50 years and the data are in. So it turns out that less than 20% of the population, probably less than 10% of the population is genetically robust enough to tolerate the sad. Um, so it's a great piece of data. Like there are people out there who can, you know, eat KFC and Doritos and pizza anytime they want, and they're generally okay. To a first order approximation, I would add that we don't really know the answer to this question because we don't have super granular data at the population level. But notwithstanding that, at least at the surface level, it appears that 10% of the population are largely um, you know, immune to the sad. But for the rest of the 90% of us schmucks, uh, which I'm certainly in that camp, the sad is lethal. And so you've got to come up with a way to you know, escape the gravitational pull of the sad. And that's why I think having these three levers at your disposal is, is the key. And yeah, I think that what happens is people get so into the camp of their lever, like it's all time restriction or it's all dietary restriction. Not too many people are in the all calorie restriction group. Um, there's a whole calorie restriction society and there, so there certainly are people that are in that camp. Um, but it's usually the first two camps that have the, the most zealots. Levers. I was waiting for the Canadian to come out. Love, <laughs> I was, love those levers. Uh, and I think, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Process. Process. <laughs> <It's the> process. <laughs> <laughs> and I also think I, I said, bite thy tongue. I don't practice my older English much. I think it's thine tongue, but I'm sure the internet will correct me. Quick uh, tactical question. And then I want to ask you about any research or studies that have been interesting to you that have come out since we last spoke. Uh, is it 
effective or have you tested using small amounts of branched chain amino acids to mitigate the muscle loss during what we would otherwise consider fasting? And, and does that affect, does that also, if it has any effect, uh, lessen the benefits of the fast? It depends on what you're doing the fast for. I think if you're doing the fast for weight loss, then the answer is absolutely knock yourself out with branched chain amino acids during strength training. Because from a caloric perspective, they represent such a yeah, 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 yeah. Like even if you were to double up on, you know, my favorite BCAAs, which are BioSteel, you know, you're, what are you going to get in there? 40 calories in two servings, right? So not an issue. If you're doing the intermittent fasting with, call it the hope of achieving some amount of the early signatures of autophagy, then I would say that it probably is counterproductive because the amino acids that you use in exercise are exactly the ones that are the most potent stimulators of mTOR. And the whole purpose of fasting, at least in the short term, is to give mTOR a rest. It's to take away that which it senses. And it is the most potent sensor of leucine, mm. which is the most important branch chain amino acid. Yeah. So if, so if, if I could dumb that down for myself, uh, if you are interested in the longevity benefits of fasting, aside from just getting to healthy body composition, you should not take the branched chain amino acids. It seems to me it would, I mean, I can't say anything with certainty, but it seems counterproductive. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. All right. Studies, any papers or studies that you found interesting? Oh my God. <laughs> so many. Uh, um, there's a lot. If you, had uh, to, if you had to cherry pick a few. Well, look, I think the recent New England Journal paper that you and I have talked about um, is very interesting comparing Lexapro to psilocybin. Um, I, I wrote about it recently and um, my little diatribe basically said, I think the paper was in some ways misinterpreted. Um, it was positioned as a negative trial, though I saw it as anything but a negative trial. Uh, maybe could, just could, for background. Could we zoom out just yeah. for a second and give people an overview of the objective or the hypothesis of, of the study? Yeah, the question that was being tested was, is um, an intermittent dose of pure synthetic psilocybin um, more effective, I think is the way the question was posed, than the top tier SSRI for uh, patients with depression. Yeah. So Lexapro is a relatively new SSRI, very it's, well tolerated. It's Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it does have sexual side effects. That's its most common side effect. Um, That's true of other SSRIs. Absolutely. As well. Yeah. SSRIs are, are known for having sexual side effects. Some of them also come with you know, incredible amounts of somnolence, incredible amounts of weight gain. Lexapro, somnolence, sleepiness. Sleepiness, yeah. Um, Lexapro seems to be relatively free of that for most people, which is why it's kind of more of a, a go-to drug. Comes in two doses, 10 and 20 milligrams. Generally, most people need 20 if they're going to go to it, but you usually start people at 10, go to 20. Um, and this is a daily It's a daily drug, yep. So, you know, the participants are divided into two groups. One group is given... Um, Lexapro, uh, let me think, I believe that they all started out at 10 milligrams for three weeks and then were increased to 20 milligrams for three weeks, or maybe it was four plus four. I can't remember. It was a relatively short study in the psilocybin group. The participants were give, oh, they were, by the way, it's an aside. They were also given one milligram of psilocybin, um, which I, is an important point I should make. And if that word is unfamiliar to folks, so psilocybin, is a molecule found in psilocybe mushrooms, also known as magic mushrooms. These are mushrooms that impart psychedelic effects at a sufficient dose. We'll come to talk about that dose. So the subjects were all recruited knowing that they would get psilocybin no matter what, because that was an important recruiting tool. People wanted to be in a study where they were gonna get the psilocybin. And that's, that has to be taken into account from the standpoint of patient selection. So every trial has to be thoughtful about what type of people it's selecting and are they representative of the population you're gonna to want to extrapolate your results to. So I flag this to make the point that when you have a patient population that says, I really, really wanna get psilocybin, and you say, okay, well, 
you're not going to get necessarily the full dose. There's only a 50, 50 chance you're going to get the full dose, but you're going to get some. So you're either going to mm -hmm. get one milligram or 25 milligrams. And we'll yeah. put in context what those doses mean in a second. And just to bracket one thing. So the, the, what, what makes this, what makes this study and paper worthy of discussion is that it is a head to head comparison I mean, with lots of nuance, of course, of psilocybin with, I think, two or three sessions total in the intervention arm versus uh, Lexapro, very common SSRI for major depressive disorder. Yep. Please continue. Yep. So to your point, um, the group that was in the true um, psilocybin group received, I think it's just two doses spaced out three weeks apart of 25 milligrams of psilocybin, which um, depending on the variant of mushroom, so when you dry a mushroom out, its yield of psilocybin, pure psilocybin can be as low, I mean, I went and reviewed all the lit on this, can be as low as 1.7%, can be as high by weight, can be as high as, you know, even four or 5%. Yeah, so incredible the, variability. Yeah, so the 25 milligrams was clearly a hallucinogenic dose. Yeah. Um, so probably in the four to five gram of mushroom uh, dose. So they used a number of, well, there's one other point I should explain about research. Um, generally, when research is done in a credible fashion, you have to call your shot before yeah. you do it's the like study. Pointing to center field. That's like, right. You yeah. have to be able to not just say, I'm going to hit a home run, I'm going to hit a home run over that wall. And that's called your primary objective. So um, one of the things that is important to understand when you're evaluating research is, was it pre-registered? So when the study- Right, did they call their shot by they naming call their the primary shot? outcome That's measure. right. And so in the United States, uh, anything that's funded by NIH, for example, has to be pre-registered on clinicaltrials.gov. So I would encourage anybody to go to clinicaltrials.gov and just start perusing. And what you'll see there is a list of all of these ongoing studies. They'll say, you know, started here, and it's a template, so it always looks the same, and it's very easy to navigate these things. You know, here are the investigators, here's the hypothesis, here's the experimental design, here's the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria, here are the primary, here is the primary outcome, here are the secondary outcomes, and it shows you all of that stuff. So you have to pre-register this, you have to state what you're doing. If you don't do that, it becomes very difficult to publish your work in anything prestigious. This, of course, was published in the, hands down, most prestigious medical journal in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine. So they pre-registered around one type of survey, one type of depressive survey. Um, because unlike, say, giving people drug to treat cholesterol, where you have an objective metric, you can say, well, did it lower ApoB or LDLC or something like that? Here you're relying on subjective outcomes because in such a short study, you're clearly not going to be able to follow people for, wait, was there less depression in this, or was there less suicide in this group or something, you know, like a hard outcome, you know, um, did people have, you know, fewer absent days from work or something like that. So the, uh, and it's been a while since I wrote this, uh, the primary survey that they used, I believe had nine categories, or maybe it was 12. And um, the difference between the groups, the Lexapro group and the psilocybin group, um, was not statistically significant. So both groups achieved an improvement in their depressive scores. Yeah, I think it was six and four points, respectively. Correct, and I think it was a nine-point so, scale. Something like that. Yes. But you, you pointed out something very important, and I guess we should just step back for a second. So the, the upshot, and then let's come back to these questions, but the, the upshot summary of the study was what? There was no difference between this drug and it basic between psilocybin and this drug. It was positioned as a negative study. Got it. Meaning it, I mean, I don't want to say failed because that's just not really how science works, but it, it, that the intervention did not, meaning, well, psilocybin in this case was not superior to. That's right. It was a, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ty. That's right. Uh, all right. So this, this is a topic that is endlessly interesting to me. Uh, what we're getting into, which is study design and really digging into the nuance and how beneficial it is to know how to read a study. And uh, I mean, this will, will seem like <laughs> uh, maybe uh, 
just a, a friendly plug, but I highly recommend people read a series of articles that you published and they are called, what is it? Studying the studies or studying studies, studying studies to increase your scientific literacy, because we're going to get into some of the weeds. And I think it'll be, I, I, I hope it'll be interesting to people. And, and the other thing we're doing, if I can plug something and I don't know when we'll have this out yet, but we're creating a course, um, where about a year ago we started recording our weekly journal club, our part our monthly journal club. So every month inside our practice, we do journal club, um, which is just like old school journal club for anybody who's been in a lab. So one person will present a paper. It usually takes an hour to an hour and a half. And we get into an, a complete dissection of the paper. And we do it in a really kind of methodical way. And the, the topics vary greatly. So I highly recommend everyone do this. Honestly, witnessing the complete mayhem and confusion over the last year with respect to anything science related, uh, certainly the most obvious of which being anything COVID or vaccine related has, has made it so clear to me that this is really, I, I mean, it's hard for me to think of something that is higher priority. If Yeah. And we just decided to do this. I mean, you know, we've been doing journal club inside our practice for years, but it occurred to me a year ago, why aren't we recording this to later package yeah. and put out there? Because nobody is, nobody comes out of the womb knowing how to read science. Like we yeah. just have to no, accept the fact. It's completely learned. It's, yeah. It is a totally non-innate thing. Evolution had zero desire to teach us this skill. So you have to learn it. And, you know, some of us were really lucky to be in labs where people were really good mentors and they, they beat into you how to do this. And, um, and, and again, the topics that we explore are, you know, the latest on semaglutide, which we'll talk about today. I think, um, you know, the role of testosterone replacement therapy in men with type two diabetes, a huge paper that came out recently, uh, this topic. So, um, it doesn't matter what the subject matter is. The The process of thinking is actually quite yeah, similar. The process of, di of thinking, dissecting and, skeptically but not necessarily cynically looking at the purported outcomes i think is is really important so coming back to the coming back to this paper super prestigious journal study comes out psilocybin versus lexapro negative study or negative outcome rather uh, then we have this questionnaire let's just call it that is determining the results and the results come back the differences come back as statistically insignificant however right as you pointed out when you wrote about this that doesn't necessarily mean clinically insignificant depending and nor does it mean that it wasn't so let's go back and explain what statistical significance is as well because now there's three points you reminded me of something else that i think is worth stating how is statistical significance determined and what does it mean we hear this term all the time um, statistical significance is basically asking a question. What is the probability that the difference that's observed between these groups is by chance? Um, to answer that question, you have to know a priori, how big an effect size you would expect to see between these two groups. A priori, meaning beforehand, you need to know what magnitude of difference you that's would right. expect to see between the two groups. That's right. And that's really important because that determines what's called the power of your study. Mm -hmm. and, and that is how you need to, sorry to keep jumping yeah, in yeah. here, but the, the part of the importance of determining or speculating or guessing correctly, the magnitude of difference, like the difference in effect sizes, because that also will determine how many subjects you need to recruit. That's right. So there's something called a power table which I think we include in one of the studying studies um, uh, articles, which I remember when I got to the lab was one of the first things my PI principal investigator showed me. He said, this is gonna be one of the most important tables you'll ever pay attention to when you're doing research. Because the table has on, um, it's a complicated table to look at, but on the like horizontal axis, it has, effect size of treatment a on the vertical axis it has difference between treatment a and treatment b so this will be like 10 percent, 15 percent, 20 percent and then here it would be like 5 10 15 20 so for example treatment a would yield if you predict it's going to be a 30 percent effect size versus a 40 percent effect size you go to 30 and 10 
Does that make sense? Yep. You're the baseline plus the delta. And then within each square, you typically have two options at either 80 or 90% power. Obviously 90% power means an even higher standard and it requires more sample, like it has a greater sample size. So it's very common in research to underestimate or overestimate your effect size. And if you overestimate the effect size, you can underpower a study. And I think there's actually a pretty sizable chance that that happened here. Yeah. Because the power analysis suggested they were looking for a four point difference on this scale. It came back with two. It came back with a little over two. A little over two. Yeah. Average. So it's not surprising that it came back not statistically significant because they had engineered the number of participants to only be statistically significant if there was a difference of four points or greater. And so on the one hand, you would say, well, that's really impressive. That was a very high bar. My question is, was it too high a bar? Is four points necessary when you're really trying to do a study against the gold standard, right? It would be one thing if you were doing a study against a placebo, where you do want to set a very, very high bar. But this is akin to almost like a phase three drug trial where you're trying to compare a new drug to an existing blockbuster gold standard drug and simply being non-inferior to it and maybe even potentially better on some of the secondary metrics as this one was could be more than enough to advance clinical utilization and promulgate further studies. Yeah. So that was one of my first concerns with this study was I don't think it was powered correctly because I, I do wonder if four, uh, four was too high an expectation against this treatment. Of course, other issues are, was this study long enough, right? This was a relatively short study. Mm -hmm. um, and it, look, the, it could have gone the other way. It might be that after a year, it flipped and Lexapro was hands down the winner and psilocybin's effect waned. We don't know. Um, but, but again, that's another thing to be concerned with. And then the point that you brought up um, is, which is a subset of what we were just talking about is look, maybe a two and a half point increase is clinically really relevant. And the other point here is, and I definitely want you to give, uh, if you remember, and it can be rough, but yeah. some of the examples some of, the, of the questions, that's right. And that's, that's the final point here is not all questions are created equal, right? So some of the questions on that scale are like, um, you know, do you, are there times when you don't feel good about yourself versus, you know, like there are days I can't get out of bed. Those are not the same question to me. Like those are very different questions. A person who says, yeah, like honestly, more than 50% of the time I don't feel good about myself. Clearly that's a problem. And clearly that's something you want to address, but that's, that person is probably a lot more functional than the person who says I can't get out of bed. Yeah. Or I think that, you know, the, uh, another, two examples to compare would be well, one I, about suicidal thought as well right right yeah. and or i sleep 10 or fewer hours per day or 12 or more hours per day and that might account for say a two-point difference on an individual yeah. uh questionnaire but then another question which was something like i feel badly about myself most of the time versus or on a daily basis versus uh say less than half the time or, or something along those lines. Yeah. Then, then as you mentioned, questions about that, that could include suicidal ideation. So not all points are created equal. Right. Uh, you know, another thing that, um, you know, I wondered because um, I have, you know, in part helped fund research at Imperial College, uh, where, where this came out of, and a bunch of other places. And in conversations with a number of different neuroscientists, they said, well, these are people who are very experienced with uh, designing studies and being published, they said, well, you know, there are times when you, you have to choose between the primary outcome measure you think the establishment, so to speak, is going to most respect, or the primary outcome measure that you think is going to move the most. And this could be a case, and I'm not speaking for uh, Robin or anyone else involved with this study, but this could be an example of picking what the establishment would have wanted to see, and then having the the secondary outcome measures move 
uh, in some some very interesting ways that uh, maybe in retrospect could have or should have been the primary outcome measure. Correct. If you had more confidence in those to begin with, uh, so it's it's just. Do you know what the budget was for this study? For this study, I don't, but I'm I'm glad you mentioned budget simply because I think this underscores how important, at least in the U.S., because I'm involved with with Hopkins and uh, UCSF and a number of other places, how important it is to try to open up uh, state and federal funding for this type of research from NIMH, NIH, et cetera, because right now, it's easy for someone to say, well, that was stupid. Why didn't they just have 50 people in each arm? And the answer is, it costs a lot of fucking money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to raise money uh, in, in some cases. Yeah, I mean, look, I think net-net, this study must be viewed as a very positive finding. Yeah, um, I agree. Because the side effect profile was obviously higher in Lexapro. So again, people taking Lexapro are far more likely to complain of um, if they're males, erectile dysfunction, sexual um, malfunction, reduced libido, things like that. Um, you know, how we wouldn't want to explore this to the nth degree, I don't understand. Um, and of course, there's other things I'd want to explore, like microdosing, right? These were macrodoses. So these yeah. were people taking, you know, a full hallucinogenic dose every two, three weeks, I believe. Um, and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do either. So we, you know, I'd want to understand what that's like versus what would taking a couple of milligrams per day, which would be, you know, well below the threshold of perception, or three times a week or something. You know, you hear a lot of anecdotal talk about those things being beneficial to people. I'd like to see that studied. And in some ways that would be an easier thing to study because that's the other limitation of this study, yeah. which must be noted, which is technically it was, an, it was not a blinded study. Yeah, It this, was a randomized yeah. study, but yeah. it wasn't a blinded study. There was no confusion about which group you were in. It's, uh, this is one of the biggest challenges. I think there are ways to solve for it. Uh, that I find pretty compelling from a scientific standpoint, but it's uh, very hard to blind when you're using hallucinogenic, a yeah. much less sort of mystical experience level dosing of a <laughs> psychedelic. Uh, and it raises, uh, you know, as you noted, uh, well, given the frequency of administration, so you have, say, two sessions with psilocybin at Psych clearly psychedelic doses. These would be, uh, I, I would say, in most people, sufficient to produce uh, some type of what you might call mystical experience. And there are questionnaires that Johns Hopkins uh, has developed, uh, Roland Griffiths and Matt Johnson and, and, and that team, to measure mystical experience, ego dissolution, sense of unity, etc. But when you when you look at the results, and we assume for the time being, even though I think people should look really closely at the appendices and the secondary outcome measures, let's say that they're break even. All right, this is a tie. But on one hand, as you said, you have more side effects. Uh, you have daily administration. And then on the other hand, you have administration every three weeks. And um, I, I think that were they to, and they, they may still plan on doing follow-ups of the in, at, in other university studies, there's quite a bit of durability that's seen with this type of administration of psilocybin, even out to six, 12 months. Mm -hmm. uh, it raises some really interesting questions, right? Uh, the most obvious of which is, how does this work? Yeah. Because if the SSRIs are on some level, uh, I don't want to say suppressing symptoms, uh, maybe masking tendencies, I, I don't know the right way to phrase it, but it is a maintenance drug it's an ongoing administration versus highly intermittent by what mechanism are these changes taking place right is it is it just flooding the brain with a compound that has a biochemical effect or does it relate more to changing the content and narrative and sort of what work can be done in those sessions themselves it raises a lot of interesting questions yeah and i think with mdma i think the answer is probably a bit more clear um, yeah. I think when you, prior to MDMA's resurgence and, and, you know, serious treatment for PTSD, antidepressants were the mainstay of therapy for this. And I think it was exactly what you said. I mean, uh, antidepressants for PTSD were a masking agent, um, that had some efficacy, but not tremendous efficacy. I think the runaway success we're seeing of MDMA for PTSD 
is clearly less about the chemical changes in the brain as a result of the administration of the molecule and far more about the state of mind that it puts the individual in for the type of therapy that they need to do to go back and rectify and come to grips with the traumatic event. And I think you're right. I think it's less clear here, but it also doesn't have to be one or the other. It's, it's yeah. certainly possible it could be both. And there's been, for those people who are interested in reading more, and I can link to these in the show notes uh, for this episode, there has been some great New York Times coverage of uh, the phase three trials related to MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, includes stories from subjects, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a very compelling read. The results are really pretty staggering uh, and raise a lot of... Uh, a lot of exciting questions for me uh, just about the future of treating mental illness or psychiatric disorders. And I also want to give just a uh, shout out to Rick Perry in Texas, who has been recently very public about uh, exploring psychedelic compounds as possible treatments for things like PTSD. Uh, among veteran populations and other subpopulations, so uh, th- that that I think is a very it's a very courageous and very justifiable stance to take. Uh, so I was very excited to see that, especially in the the great Republic of Texas in which we sit. <laughs> That's right. Uh, any other any other studies uh, that that come to mind? Or you mentioned ApoB. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on ApoB that you'd like to share. Yeah, certainly as it pertains to things where I'm evolving my thinking, I'm... And what is ApoB? Yeah, it's probably worth explaining that before we do anything else. So most people have heard of cholesterol. um, And most people are used to seeing a blood test where you would see your total cholesterol, LDL, HDL. And if the the lab is half decent, it would actually say LDL-C, HDL-C, non-HDL-C, VLDL-C. What does all that mean? So that means LDL cholesterol or the cholesterol contained within LDL. HDL cholesterol is the cholesterol contained within LDL. So why do all these things even exist? So every cell in our body makes cholesterol. Um, It's an essential molecule for life. So if you don't have cholesterol, you're not going to live more than, you know, a few seconds. In fact, you'll die in utero if we're going to be blunt. So every cell makes this thing. It's, it makes up the cell membrane of every cell. It's what allows membranes to have fluidity and have transporters sitting across them. It's also the backbone for many of the hormones we make. Now, the problem is cholesterol is not water-soluble. So when you have something that's not water-soluble that needs to be transported through the body, which this does because, as I said, not every cell makes enough of it to meet their own needs. So there are net exporters and net importers of cholesterol. You have to have a system that can move it around. But just like if you tried to pour olive oil into a glass of water, you would quickly realize they don't mix. And similarly, you can't just move cholesterol through the bloodstream the way you can move things like glucose, sodium, potassium, things that are water soluble. So glucose just travels through the bloodstream on its own, as does a ketone body, for example. But triglycerides, you know, have to be bound. Things that are fat soluble have to be bound. So, um, you know, Mother Nature invented something called a lipoprotein, which is a spherical thing that on the outside is water soluble and on the inside houses these water insoluble or what we call hydrophobic things, namely cholesterol ester and triglycerides. And these lipoproteins exist in two broad families and the families are defined by the protein signature that wraps around them. So the two families are the ApoB family and the ApoA family. Technically, there's a subclass of the ApoBs. There's an ApoB100 and an ApoB48. But for the most part, anybody that's talking about ApoB is referring to ApoB100. The ApoB48 is only something called a chylomicron. It is a very short-lived lipoprotein that gets fat out of your gut. So let's put that guy aside for the moment unless anyone wants to come back and we'll do the advanced course on the weekend. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Advanced course for the midichlorians, you nerds (laughs) out there. All right. Continue. So your, your ApoB family consists of very low density lipoprotein or VLDL, intermediate density lipoprotein or IDL, 
low density lipoprotein or LDL and LP little a, who is the worst actor of the bunch, which is an LDL with another special lipoprotein wrapped around him called an ApoA or an apolipoprotein little a. Not ApoA, I should be really clear. It's apolipoprotein little a. You have to specify little a to not confuse it with the ApoA family. The ApoA family is the lineage of the high density lipoproteins. Okay. Most people know that HDL good, LDL bad, but that's a little overly simplistic. What we really mean to say is that HDLs do not cause atherosclerosis, LDLs do. But it turns out LDLs aren't the only thing that cause atherosclerosis. Anything with an ApoB on it causes atherosclerosis. And just just to just for the for the, for the listeners, <laughs> atherosclerosis meaning the buildup of plaque within the cardiovascular system. Or yeah, how do you it's, think the, of it's the it's the stiffening or it's the inflammatory disease of arteries mm -hmm. that ultimately results in plaque formation. And in the worst case scenario results in rupture of this plaque that leads to an acute thrombosis or an acute occlusion. And if it occurs in the wrong spot, that can be um, fatal, instantly fatal. Got it. So VLDLs stick around for long enough that if you have too many of them, they are atherogenic. IDLs are not really a problem because they just don't last that long. So the transit from VLDL to IDL and then IDL to HDL occurs or to LDL is so quick that the IDLs are kind of irrelevant. LDLs, of course, are the majority of your ApoB concentration, unless you also have a lot of insulin resistance where you might have a lot of VLDLs, or if you have a genetic condition that predisposes you to have too many of those. The IDLs, again, we don't really worry about those. The LDLs are the lion's share of your ApoB, and about one in eight to one in 12 people also have a very genetically high level of LP little a, and that also represents um, uh, part of the ApoB concentration. So. ApoB is a far superior measurement to LDLC when trying to predict cardiovascular risk. So it is hands down the best biomarker we have for cardiovascular risk because it is the total concentration of all particles capable of inducing atherosclerosis. Now, atherosclerosis is multifactorial, so lots of things drive it. Inflammation plays an important role and metabolic health plays a super important role. Um, but we understand that lower ApoB is better. Where I think the, tr the data are becoming more and more clear is how low you can push this thing without unwanted effects and how much more benefits you can get. So there's always a concern, I think, and understandably so, that if you lower ApoB, you're lowering cholesterol. Because if you have fewer of the particles that carry cholesterol, you have less cholesterol floating around the blood. But what most people don't understand is that that's sort of like saying, I'm going to reduce the number of cars traveling over this bridge. Does that necessarily mean you're reducing the number of cars in the city? Not necessarily. So most of the cholesterol in your body is not in the lipoproteins rummaging around through your veins. Um, again, most of the cholesterol is still sitting inherently in the cells itself. So if you took a person's total cholesterol and it was 200 milligrams per deciliter and you lowered it and up by total cholesterol, by the way, at this point, I, I assume is straightforward to explain. It's the sum of all the cholesterol and all the lipoproteins. So the VLDL, IDL, LDL, LP little a, and HDL. If you bash all of those particles and take out all the cholesterol, that's what your total cholesterol is. If you took that number from 200 to 100, you would say, God, that's a 50% reduction in your cholesterol. No, it's a 50% reduction in your serum cholesterol, which might be like a 5 to 10% reduction in your total body cholesterol. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is we are born with very, very low levels of cholesterol. So in a child, the ApoB concentration is probably in the ballpark of 30, 20 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. By the time we're adults, a level of 80 milligrams per deciliter would put you at the 20th percentile, meaning 80% of people would have a higher number than 80. What's the upshot of this? The upshot of this is there's no upside to having more ApoB, right? The, uh, the upside is in having that number be lower and lower and lower. But until recently, it wasn't clear how low you could drive it. And there was a, 
a, a type of drug that was developed about, well, I mean, developed about 17, 18 years ago, but it, be, it, it became clinically available. Uh, I shouldn't say that actually, it's probably started development in about 05. So it's called 16 years ago. Um, hit the market in 2014 or 2015, a class of drug called PCSK9 inhibitors. And they work um, in a manner that's distinct from all previous drugs that lower cholesterol. They work by inhibiting a protein that degrades LDL receptors on the liver. And by inhibiting this thing that degrades them, you get more of the LDL receptors on the liver. It pulls more of the LDL it pulls more of the ApoB bearing particles out of circulation. Um, mostly, which are LDL particles, but also some LP little a particles. With these trials, we see people achieving levels of ApoB in the 10 to 30 range um, with no side effects, no consequences. Furthermore, these drugs were developed when populations of people were identified who naturally had mutations in PCSK9 that rendered their PCSK9 ineffective. So this was basically a drug that was designed to mimic a genetic mutation found in people who over the course of their lives have no um, increased risk of any disease and simply have a decrease in their risk of cardiovascular disease. In fact, the risk of cardiovascular disease is virtually non-existent. Let me ask a silly question. How does, how does one find people who have such a mutation to track them? Well, it started with the opposite. So there's a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, or FH for short, which are people who have very high levels of cholesterol and very high levels of LDL cholesterol, and by extension, very high levels of ApoB. And they're pretty easy to spot. Um, but it's a definition that is based on phenotype, not genotype. So it's a mm, genetic condition, but it's one phenotype, but 3,000 or more genotypes, meaning there are thousands of different genetic mutations that lead to that. I think it was in the late 90s, one of those genetic pathways was identified as a hyper-functioning PCSK9. So a group in Toronto identified PCSK9 and realized that these people had a hyper-functioning version of this protein, and it was constantly degrading LDL receptors. And so they just couldn't clear the ApoB out of their circulation, and that's why they had sky-high LDL and total cholesterol. When that population was identified, the question was asked, which is, is there a counterpart to them? And it turns out to be really easy to identify them because they're the opposite. These are people who don't take any medicine to lower their cholesterol and they have levels like infants. Mm. And then it was realized. And I remember actually reading that paper when it came out and being blown away and actually thinking there's no way they're going to be able to do this with a drug. Um, but it turned out it was, it was actually pretty druggable. Um, it wasn't that hard to do. Uh, and in many ways, it's a much cleaner drug than, say, a statin. Like statins, which are, despite all of the public mayhem around it and the religious polarizing debates around statins, statins are really safe drugs. 10% of people have unwanted side effects and shouldn't take them, um, but they're very well-tolerated drugs. And in my mind, that's kind of a miracle when you consider what they do, which is they inhibit cholesterol synthesis. And when you think about how important cholesterol synthesis is, it's kind of amazing to me that that works without killing people. My hypothesis for this, by the way, is that statins occurred in nature. So the first statins were really copying something that was found in nature called red yeast rice. And as a general rule, I think things that came from nature tend to be a little safer. You know, psilocybin, um, rapamycin, metformin, some of my other favorite drugs. Um, but this, the, the method of, by which the PCSK9 works is, is just elegant because it's really just targeting one protein with a you know with an antibody that makes it um, harder for the LDL receptor to break down. Are there any benefits to lowered or low ApoB uh, outside of cardiac risk, lowering cardiac risk? Yeah, there actually or is. Or I shouldn't say cardio, yeah, cardiovascular yeah, risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 that's sort of. Um, I mean, I think we've known for, for a while that it also poses a benefit with respect to Alzheimer's disease, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and that's one of those things where I think one needs to be a little bit careful about never confusing population data with individual data. And it's why I think population data are fantastic, but every patient has to be 
completely assessed as an individual. So at the population-based data, for as long as we've had statins, we've known that lower ApoB or lower LDLC means less risk of Alzheimer's disease. And if you think about some of the paths by which people get Alzheimer's disease, there's clearly a vascular path. So Alzheimer's disease is not a disease. Uh, in, in, in just in the same way, cancer is not a disease singular. It's many diseases, not just tissue type, but even within tissue type, you know, within breast cancer, for example, you have different receptor profiles, the same within lung cancer. So, or even just the mutation can render two cancers completely different animals. And similarly, Alzheimer's disease is a collection of lots of diseases with a final common pathway, but you can get there metabolically. You can get there through a vascular path. You can get there through an inflammatory path. Uh, there might even be an autoimmune path there. The vascular path is a big path in my opinion. And therefore anything that improves microvascular health, which statins do should improve, mm -hmm. um, uh, the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So there was something called the Mendelian randomization that was published, I think like literally a week ago. And I'll explain Mendelian, what a Mendelian randomization. Was this yeah. Gregor Mendel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess I should explain what it, what, a, what an MR is first. MR is, um, Mendelian randomization. Correct. Is a very elegant tool that allows us to try to infer cause when an experiment is not done. This is, this is a profound idea, right? Because when you just observe things without doing an experiment, which by definition means randomly assigning treatments or assigning treatments to randomly separated groups, which is the only way to eliminate all bias. Um, there are other biases that can creep in, which we could, I mean, which are actually discussed in the studying studying section. I won't go into like performance bias and other things like that, but for much of the questions we're interested in, you can't do that. You have to rely on natural experiments. Um, so what MR allows you to do is identify genes that are responsible for the traits at hand and not responsible for other traits and do basically a model of what does that genetic trait tell you when it's present or not present. So the, the idea is in an MR analysis, you're basically assuming that genes can occur randomly, which of course they can. And you're then looking at what is the outcome from that? So for example, in the case of ApoB, you would look at genes that are determining ApoB level. And there are many genes that play an important role in understanding how high or low a person's ApoB is. And these genes are set right? It's sort of like you get the gene, you get, you know, you're not going to change the gene and it's not subject to your behavior, right? Whereas so many other things like what you eat is a behavior that can also impact your ApoB. So it, it's, it's how do you strip that effect out, the healthy user bias, all of the things that are, are problematic when trying to infer this. And the MR demonstrated quite clearly that lower ApoB is synonymous with improved all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and even mortality associated with diabetes and things like that. To me, the most interesting finding in there was the all-cause mortality. I, you know, on the one level you could say, well, that's not surprising given that cardiovascular mortality is the greatest cause of mortality in the developed world. So if you take a big enough chunk out of that, you should um, improve all-cause mortality. But nevertheless, that trial or the, not that trial, that study combined with a number of other um, very large cardiovascular trials, uh, namely Fourier, Odyssey, Improve It. Every, every trial has to have a cool name. Um, <laughs> just demonstrate this effect where lower is better. The lower the LDL goes or the ApoB goes, the lower the risk goes. Hmm. Let's jump to rapamycin since you, since you mentioned it. And uh, we can give a very quick <laughs> idea on what rapamycin is. But since we last spoke, uh, more bearish, more bullish, and why? Um, I am. I'm a bull. Yeah. <laughs> Dogecoin and rapa, <laughs> diamond hands. All right. <laughs> so, so what is rapa? By the way, tell, I mean, I know, I know what the diamond hands thing is, but what is it? Where did it come from? Like, I have no idea. 
Yeah. I have no idea where Diamond Hands comes from. Okay. I, I was like, did I miss that somewhere in my in my in reading? Your, in your in your econ classes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. I don't think so. Okay. So what is rapamycin? So rapamycin is a drug that um is a naturally occurring uh anti fungal agent made by a bacteria that was discovered on Easter Island uh, back in the 1960s. Otherwise known as Rapa Nui. Right. Rapa Nui is the correct name for Easter Island and the bacteria Streptomyces hydroscopicus, which was discovered there by a group of explorers. Um, explorers is maybe the wrong word, but people doing sort of medical prospecting. Uh, a group from Montreal, I believe, in call it 1966, they took a bunch of soil and dirt back from Rapa Nui to the lab in Montreal, where it sort of sat there unattended to for about five years. Uh, a chemist, a very astute chemist by the name of Seren Segal. Right now. Yeah, he started Related mucking to around. Seagal? No. Different. <laughs> 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 uh, and no ponytail, fortunately. <laughs> um, so Seren did some really interesting chemistry, isolated the compound, and noticed it had these really remarkable properties, which was it was the most potent antifungal agent he had ever seen, or the world had ever seen, frankly. Um, at the time, uh, as his son Ajit tells the story, um, who I've gotten to know a little bit, he felt he had basically come onto the biggest blockbuster, blockbuster cure, cure for athlete's foot the world was ever going to know. And right about that time, the company he worked for closed its Montreal headquarters, actually laid many people off, ordered the destruction of all non-viable compounds, and shipped him off to New Jersey um, in one of the greatest acts of scientific fortuity he did not follow orders <laughs> and he instead stuck said rapamycin into a little mini freezer that he and his family transported to their new home in new jersey they kept it in the freezer for many years until ultimately um, another drug company purchased the company he worked for and the new management said hey anybody working on anything interesting he said i'm, I'm working on this thing interesting that i haven't looked at in a few years and they said bring it out must have been an interesting uh lawyer conversation <laughs> <laughs> based on the not following orders yeah. we'll continue yeah so out came uh rapamycin which he named uh mycin cool. and you know mycin is typically the uh the prefix, the suffix, I guess that we use, or what's the what's the second part of a word suffix. called suffix? Yeah, for for antimicrobial agents, and of course, rapa is a tribute to the Rapa Nui, uh, like it, azithromycin. Correct. Yeah. So it it quickly became clear that this had remarkable anti proliferative properties. So it could stop things from proliferating. So that was obviously a big not part of, just fungi. Right. Exactly. And in particular. Um, it was very effective at making a certain type of lymphocyte, which is a white type of white blood cell, not proliferate. And it then basically went down the path. Eventually, Pfizer then bought Amaris, which was the company that bought his previous company, whose name I don't even remember at this point. Um, Pfizer ended up pursuing this, and it was FDA approved in 1999 for treatment of organ transplantation. So patients that have an organ transplanted have to be put on a really heavy regimen of drugs to suppress a part of their immune system called the cellular immune system that will attack a foreign organ. That's, what is that called? Host graft? No. No, graft versus host graft versus is host. actually when the organ, usually it's in the case of lymphoma or leukemia, when someone has a bone marrow transplant and the the graft, what they've been transplanted, attacks the host. Uh, I see. Yeah, I yeah. See. This right. is this is really host versus graft, but yeah, we don't usually call graft. it that. Yeah, but traditional sort of you know rejection. And actually, I did a really cool podcast on the topic of organ transplantation history with a guy named Chris Sonnenday. And it's, I mean, I know this subject well, but having a discussion with Chris really opened my eyes to just what a beautiful story it is and what the big breakthroughs were with drug development and how, you know, at one point it was like all you could give people was prednisone and you couldn't save anybody. And then, you know, you had other drugs like cyclosporin that were introduced, but then you get into this third generation of amazing drugs like rapamycin that took organ, uh, you know, preservation to a, to a higher level. Now you're not swapping kidneys. How do you know? Well, at least not since the last time you sold one <laughs> <laughs> in uh, Tijuana. <laughs> Settle a bet, but uh, why would you take rapamycin? I know I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Well, let's so. yeah, so let's skip ahead. So, so 99, this drug comes on the market for um, for for organ rejection, 
And about 12 years later, a study gets published by Rich Miller, Randy Strong, and colleagues as part of what's called the Interventions Testing Program, or the ITP, which is an amazing NIH-funded program that tests molecules that um, are believed to have a shot at enhancing longevity. And it does so in a really, really rigorous way, probably the most rigorous way we can test small animals. Um, I've interviewed Rich Miller as well, it, probably one of my five favorite podcasts in terms of like nerding out on all of the molecules that can potentially impact, impact longevity. And rapamycin was in many ways the poster child for the ITP program because, um, first of all, it's hard to get anything to live longer. Um, second of all, when they were making the formulation for the rapamycin to feed the mice, and these were very special mice. These were not your typical crappy lab mice <laughs> that have no bearing whatsoever to real animals. These are a very special type of mice that are much more akin to real animals. And that's a very important distinction between what happens in 99% of mouse research, which is almost inapplicable to humans. And it's why so many drugs that get tested in these, you know, B6 mice and things like that, you know, show some marker of success and they become wild failures beyond the mice. But this was different. They had trouble getting the formulation to work. And by the time they finally did, the mice were like 20 months old, which means they're almost at the end of their life. They're like 70 year old, 65 year old mice. And they contemplated just scrapping the experiment, but they were like, ah, eh, screw it. Let's just run it late. So they started feeding the treatment group with rapamycin and the placebo group get to continue eating their regular chow. Okay. So it was oral administration. Yes. It was the rapamycin was mixed into their chow and Lo and behold, the rapamycin group, despite initiating treatment so late in life, had a staggering improvement in lifespan. Um, there's been so many ITPs that have replicated this. I don't want to misquote it, but it's something to the effect of like a 17 or 19 percent improvement in the males um, or in the females and 11 to 12 percent in the males. And remember, the ITP uses a very rigorous way of assessing this, which is they're taking a look at the remaining life. Uh, or sorry, they're taking a look at total life, not just remaining life. So it's a it's it's an even higher bar to clear what how much lifespan elongation happens. They of course immediately went and repeated the study, administering the dose when they were younger, and saw an even greater response. This has been repeated over and over and over again. Um, and to my knowledge, there is not a single animal study that has tested this hypothesis that has not found well, this yeah. result. Oh, that's wild. Um, which again is very unusual. Yeah. So it's, it's just replicated over and over and over. It's and replicated over. nonstop. Uh, what is also interesting is when looking at other markers, other interesting things such as vision and hearing and other markers of health span, we continue to see improvements in these things for animals as well. And as I think we even spoke about before, a guy named Matt Caberline, who I am uh, just interviewed for a second time for the podcast, um, has been studying this in companion dogs and looking at heart function. Because as you know, basically two things kill companion dogs, primarily heart failure and cancer. And so the question is, what would you be able to do to mitigate um, especially heart failure, congestive heart failure in dogs, especially large dogs, which are more susceptible to this. Um, and again, the, the, the results, though the research is limited because there's not an enormous interest in funding this research, and it's expensive to fund research in dogs that live so long, um, it, it's all pointing in the same direction. So when you contrast metformin and rapamycin, you have the opposite thing, right? In metformin, we have tons of human data that are not randomized, but are suggesting in cohorts that metformin is also protective, uh, but in a subset of people that have diabetes. So it's not as clear how protective metformin will be in, in people that do not. In the ITP, metformin did not succeed. In other words, metformin did not extend uh, life in the mice when given alone. When it was given with rapamycin, it did, but you could argue that was all the rapamycin. Um, I'm more bullish on Rapa simply because I'm, you know, I've been taking it now for three years outside of- And you can hear dog whistles. <laughs> <laughs> um, outside of, um, you know, 
the aphthous ulcers, which are the most annoying side effect of them. Those that are those little mouth ulcers. Yeah, the little mouth sores you like get. Like a canker sore. Yep. Yeah. Um, which you don't get, I don't get them de novo, but if I, like if one of my kids headbutts me, which they do at a, an alarming frequency, um, and my, if I break a piece of my gum, like it's going to be an aphthous ulcer. Mm. Although what I, is it called again? Aphthous ulcer. Aphthous? Yeah. A P H T H O S. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. Nasty. Nasty. It doesn't sound fun. Um, so that's the only, is that the only documented in healthy normals? I, I don't know who has, is, would fund this research if anyone would, um, or I don't know what, I guess I don't even know what the measurements, the metrics would be, but. Well, that gets to the problem. We yeah. don't have a meaningful biomarker of aging. Yeah. I mean, that's full stop. The biggest problem in aging research today, hands down, nothing else matters. Yeah. When you don't have a really good biomarker for aging, we're sort of sitting around twiddling our thumbs, pontificating, doing studies that look at things that aren't that interesting or things that are interesting, but are like, you know, first order, second order, you know, but we just, we can't see the whole polynomial, right? Like if you think back to like yep. what a Taylor series is in calculus, if you're trying to use a polynomial to estimate sine X, the first order term is X equals Y. Like yep. that's, interesting for about that much. But you know, when you really want to know X minus X cubed over three factorial plus X to the five over five factorial, like when you want to really start figuring out the shape of this thing, you've got to, you're just going to need better tools. So as we're talking about rapamycin, I think naturally a lot of people listening will think of lifespan. It's a term they're more familiar with, right? Yep. Start to finish. What's, what, what are you clocking in, in terms of years? And then there's health span. And you know, I took a note, as I always take notes during these conversations, about the vision and the hearing. So I'm 43 and recently had a, not, not quite an audiology test. I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was, it was quite basic hearing test done mm -hmm. and seemed to have some minor hearing loss in the higher ranges on one side. Could have been some of the ambient noise in the room. I don't know. I'd like to try to replicate it. But could one make a compelling argument that rapamycin could improve restoring that type of hearing? Or is that too much of a stretch? No, it's just too soon to say. I, yeah. I, I think it's certainly plausible, but I think it's it's too early to say. I mean, we, we're, we've seen that we've seen that in animals now. We've seen we've seen that in animals, but I don't know if that's going to translate to humans. Has that been seen in multiple species? I've only seen it in mice. In mice, yeah. But these are the these are kind of the feral mice versus the like Holstein cows of mice. Um, to be honest with you, I don't <laughs> remember what mice were used in that study, um, but it's quite possible they were your garden variety genetically not so interesting mice. Yeah. Got it. You know, you've, you've, you've hinted at or outright identified a big challenge, which is how do you study a drug in healthy people? And by the way, a drug that has a little bit of a bad rap, right? Immune suppressing drugs don't have people very excited. Yep. And until 2014, uh, until Christmas day, 2014 or Christmas Eve day, I didn't think of this as very interesting. So in 2011, you have the first ITP published and it's like, wow, that's cool. But I used to give this to tr kidney transplant patients. I'm not taking that. And then you had uh, Joan Manick was the lead author on a study that came out at the end of 2014 that looked at a rapamycin derivative called Everolimus. And it was given to um, uh, 65 year olds in the following fashion. There were four groups, a group that was given a placebo, a group that was given one milligram every day, a group that was given five milligrams once a week, and a group that was given 20 milligrams once a week. And they were given this for a period of eight weeks, I believe. And then they were taken off everything for another period of, I believe, six weeks. And then they were challenged with a flu vaccine and then looked to see who mounted the best immune response. And, you know, counter to what you would expect, the people in rapamycin developed a better immune response which flew entirely in the face of what one would have expected. Um, the group getting five milligrams once a week was in the best. They had the best response and the fewest side effects. So the 20, um, we probably don't want to go down this path because it's just more complicated. There are two complexes of mTOR. There's this, have we talked, we got to talk about mTOR. How does rapamycin work, right? It, 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 it works by inhibiting um, something called mTOR. 
the mechanistic target of rapamycin. We could also refer people to our conversation with David Sabatini. Absolutely. Back on yeah. Easter Island. Back on Easter Island. So long story short, there was a trip. It may or may not have involved some wine <laughs> uh, to Rapa Nui, to Easter Island. And one of, uh, one of our trip mates was David Sabatini, who, Q Peter, was the first person to identify how rapamycin worked in mammals. Yeah. So we, we talk about that quite a bit in that episode. So I think if you just search Tim Ferriss show Easter Island, <laughs> I can't imagine there are many results. And you will see an amazing crow arm displayed <laughs> by another one of our trip mates, uh, which happens to just be an artifact from a weird panoramic shot. But we did use that photo just to just to shape his nuts a bit. Uh, so let's see. Yeah. So let's just wrap that up by saying yeah. that the five milligram dose seemed to be the sweet spot once a week. It produced all the benefit without the side effects. 20 produced a similar benefit, but had too many side effects. Do you no longer take metformin? I do not. Mm, interesting. What were some of, I know you referred to, what was his last name? Miller. Oh, Rich Miller. Rich Miller. What are some of the other candidates that are most interesting to you in terms of pharmacological interventions that, that might extend? lifespan or health span? There are several others that were found to have uh, significant lifespan enhancement uh, repeatedly. One is a carbos, um, oh, yeah. which is uh, a favorite of our mutual friend, Kevin Rose. <laughs> Uh, a carbos was introduced by, um, so the way the ITPs work is really cool. Anybody can suggest a compound. So it's, it's basically like, uh, you know, it's like a crowdsourcing thing where you can decide, like, I want to know if this molecule has a benefit. And as long as you can write the proposal, which contains the rationale for why, if they buy it, like they're going to study it. So a carbos was suggested because the idea is a carbos prevents the absorption of starch. Yep. So if you eat a pizza, you can, you know, have half of it leave your body basically without being absorbed. So um, <laughs> still no, footnote for Kevin, <laughs> I think the ratio of donuts and beer to acarbos does matter probably at some point. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you can only take so much acarbos. I mean, it yeah. is a little hard on your gut because yeah. it's in the gut that it's preventing the absorption. <laughs> um, and the thinking was, well, acarbos, if it's eliminating a reasonable fraction of your glucose, is going to be a caloric restriction mimetic or a CRM as they call them. So let's see if that works. And it turned out a carbos did work, but interestingly, the animals hadn't, the animals who lived longer weren't any lighter and didn't have any lower levels of average glucose mm -hmm. than their shorter lived counterparts. So whatever a carbos was doing to extend life, it wasn't through making you eat uh, less or making you weigh less or making you even have a lower hemoglobin A1C. Mm -hmm. It almost assuredly worked by the only other thing it did, which was lower the, sp the spikes and peaks of glucose. It blunted those. Mm. So it spreads out the speed with which glucose is hitting you, but lowers the spikes. Are you more bullish on a carbos than metformin? No, I don't think so. I would still probably put metformin as a more interesting agent. I mean, a carbos, first of all, is just not an easy agent to take. Yeah. I mean, unless you like diarrhea. Um, well, and maybe, for those, maybe Giardia is also a caloric <laughs> restriction <yeah>. mimetic. <laughs> so, um, and, and honestly, your monthly for, dose of typhoid fever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm always one, I'm just one Giardia about away from goal weight. Um, I'm still more, more optimistic about metformin, but also metformin is more of a mystery. Uh, in fact, our mutual friend, our other mutual friend from Easter Island, Nav Chandel, yeah. This is one of the things that he works on extensively. Mr. Crow Arms. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'll be having Nav back on the podcast probably in early 22. Nav is fantastic. When, when there's some killer work that he's doing on the mechanisms of metformin. And, cool. and we'll, we'll dive back into that. Um, but there is another drug that I think is super exciting that was recently published in the ITP called Canagaflozin. Ooh, Canagaflozin. Canagaflozin, spelt actually as it sounds with a C. Mm-hmm. And it is a class of drug <clears throat> known as an SGLT2 inhibitor. Rolls up the tongue. Yeah, <laughs> the SGLT2i. And it works in the kidney. It's a more elegant version of a carbose working in the kidney. Mm. So the kidney is kind of a cute organ. Um, cute in that it's really smart, right? I think evolution figured out that it would be too difficult to know all the things that are bad for you 
but it's really easy to know all the things that are good for you. So the way the kidney works is it gets a, obviously a staggering amount of your circulation, like 25% of your cardiac output is passing through your kidneys with every time your heart pumps. And the first pass of the kidney is to take everything in your blood and dump it out. So it's sort of like saying, I'm going to clean my drawers by throwing everything on the floor and then only putting back in my drawers the things that I want. And because again, it's easier to know you need glucose, you need potassium, you need magnesium, you need sodium, da, 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 as opposed to this toxin might, that might appear a hundred years from now or a million years from now. So in the reabsorption process, Canaga flows and blocks the reuptake of glucose. Hmm. So you end up peeing out a lot of glucose. So this drug obviously was introduced to treat people with type two diabetes. And it showed remarkable efficacy in doing that. So in a, in a healthy subject, you would be presenting the sort of traditional old-fashioned symptoms of diabetes. Yeah, although not quite to the same extent because it's sort of gradient-driven. Yeah. So in the traditional Osler sense where, yeah. you know, literally diagnoses of diabetes was made by tasting the urine and seeing how yeah. sweet it was. Yeah. Uh, those were patients that were presenting with, you know, wildly uncontrolled diabetes with a glucose of I like 800 it. milligrams per deciliter. You yeah. know, they're about to have a coma. I first learned what diabetes was when I was in Japan as an exchange student and it's tonyobyo, which is sugar urine disease and you, it's really obvious in the characters i had no idea what di diabetes you know i heard it on the oatmeal commercial Which is interesting because I, i'm guessing nobody in japan actually has diabetes <laughs> yeah i in today yeah today, today yeah. when you know you have people eating like rice with mayonnaise yeah slightly yeah. more but when yeah. you were there yeah there's probably there's yeah. like five people with diabetes yeah, in the yeah very few um so kanaga flows in mimics um or, or basically blunts this reabsorption of glucose uh, very successful drug for the treatment of diabetes and also um, in people with diabetes uh, is showing better effects when it comes to heart failure, um, better effects when it comes to mortality. It, this is really, in my opinion, a first line drug for any patient with diabetes yeah. and it does not cause hypoglycemia. So if a normal person takes it, they're not going to have a, you know, a dangerous drop in blood sugar. So it is also blunting the spikes, but it also seems to lower the average as well. Mm -hmm. So Canaga flows in extended the lives of mice in the ITP. Uh, and and it, I don't remember the exact numbers. It wasn't were quite as diabetic or so. No, of, no, no, they were not. these are perfectly normal mice. It wasn't as big an effect as rapamycin, but it was bigger than most other things. There haven't been that many successes in the ITP. Obviously, most drugs fail. The, but the successes like rapamycin, uh, 17 uh, alpha estradiol, canagaflozin, acarbose, those are you know some of the big successes. And of course, they get tested over and over again to make sure they weren't one-hit wonder. What was the 17 something or other that you just mentioned? 17 alpha estradiol was a very interesting uh, molecule. 17 alpha estradiol. Which is not the estrogen. It's not normal estrogen, right, which right, is beta right. estradiol. And 17 alpha estradiol only improved the lifespan of male mice. It had no <laughs> impact on female mice. The thinking being that it somewhat mimicked the estrogen protection benefits yeah. in a male, but not in a female because they already had estrogen. Yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah. And that's not, a, that's not a molecule that, to my knowledge, is even in clinical trials. Like, I don't even know if there's an IND for that molecule that it's even, I don't know what pharma is doing with that information. Huh. How did that get submitted for the ITP. Yeah, it's funny. I asked Rich about that. Some I don't just backyard chemist who's like, hey, yeah, guys, it was, it was I inherited a bunch of oil money here. I want you to make this. No, it was effectively someone who had been studying this molecule and thought like, I wonder if this would be interesting for the hypothesized mechanism that it would huh. offer some of the protective benefits of estrogen what without the, the, without the, without the feminizing effects. Right. Yeah, so right. it's, it's, it doesn't have the sexual characteristics of estrogen. So the question is, you know, because if you gave a male a whole bunch of estrogen, you're not going to make them live longer. Yeah. Um, because whatever benefits come from it are going to be offset by a bunch of negatives. So just to scratch my own itch in curiosity here, so can someone with enough money just push whatever they want through the ITP to get something tested? Or like what combination of factors leads someone to be able to take 
a candidate or something they think is promising, like a 17 alpha. I, it's not about money. I think honestly, it's just about having the time. Like I, there's a candidate drug that I'd like to put on and I just haven't had the time to write a proposal. Uh, so maybe in a in a couple of years, I'll when I finish the book and a few other With projects. All your spare time. Yeah, I, I I there is a there is a candidate that I think would be interesting, and uh, so so no, it's just having a good scientific case for it. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Huh? Should we do some stupidity? I think sure. absurd things. Anything particularly ridiculous that you're doing these days or enjoying? <laughs> I mean, there's so many. Um, I think with the lockdown, with the whole COVID thing, I've never spent more time at home and it's been amazing. Like it's been- It's your dream come true. Oh, it's just <laughs> like, take the most antisocial person in the world and allow him to never have to go out. Um, and that's been, I think, really great for my family on some levels, but also it's mean that they've, they, it meant they've had to put up with more of my stupid jokes and the, like just the dumb things that I think about. Um, and th so one of the things that I have been really harping on and just drives my wife nuts is, um, you know, when you eat a banana at the very bottom, there's that little nubbin, Yes. you know, the little part. So I am convinced that the nubbin is like lethal. Like if you eat a nubbin, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and so all I do, I'm the nubbin police of our house. Mm. Cause a lot of times, you know how you can never finish bananas. Like you, you buy them, you buy like 10 and you might eat three, but then seven are gonna go bad. Yeah. So we peel the bad ones and put them in the freezer to make smoothies later on. Cause we always add, you know, frozen fruit to like make my protein shakes or whatever. And when I do it, I'm really careful to never put the nubbin in. Like I peel it, but I keep the nubbin in the peel and it goes in the trash. But when my wife does it, she just like Nubbin's leaves everywhere. the nubbin in. So I'm like, of course I don't care, but I act like I care. And I'm like, babe, are, are you serious? Like you got a nubbin in here. Like there's people in the house that could eat this. Like, do you understand? Like the nubbin is like literally the third leading cause of death worldwide. Not in the developed world. Here it's like the fifth leading cause of death. But when you average it out across the globe, third that leading cause right. of death, nubitis. Nubitis. And so and it just doesn't get old to me. I think the more it bugs her, the funnier it is to me. <laughs> and the same with my daughter. Like just <laughs> endless eye rolls and the they, nubbins. They don't buy it. Yeah. They really think, they claim that you can eat a nubbin and nothing will happen to you. Depends on your Topo Chico to nubbin ratio in the house. <laughs> I think you're pretty heavily weighted in the former. All right, what else? Any of the three categories, really, if, if, if there's something. I know, something else I've changed my mind on. Yeah. I'm way, way, way more bullish on sauna than I have oh, ever been yeah. before. Tell I used more. to be in the camp of sauna feels great. It maybe even helps you sleep a bit better. Um, that's probably about it. Like there's no way you're gonna really live longer because you're in a sauna. And while truthfully, we don't have really great prospective data, uh, or sorry, I should say, we have good prospective data. We don't have good randomized data. I think this is one of those things where the burden of evidence in the non-randomized data is so strong it's becoming hard to ignore. So most of the research on this subject has come out of Finland and the sauna lobby surprise, yeah um <laughs> and so there's the obvious issues with this right the people who can afford to sauna are by definition going to have more time on their hands more disposable income probably more education like all of the standard uh things on top of that if you're going to choose to sauna because you believe it's healthy what else are you doing because you believe it is healthy i mean right so so you know if if the data showed that sauna versus non-sauna was like a 5% improvement in mortality, it would be hard to get that excited about it. But when you look at the largest published series on this, you see a benefit in all-cause mortality, a relative absolute, pardon me, a relative risk reduction of 40% and an absolute risk reduction of like 18%. Those are, those are high numbers. Those are ridiculous numbers. And that's when you um, are comparing someone who own a, like saunas four to seven times a week. I was going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, so what's the dose and frequency? What's the, and stuff? Yeah. yeah, what's the dose and frequency and what do you believe the minimum effective dose to be? Kind of like the zone two training, you described what it is. And then you said, bah, let's yeah, call so three just hours a week. To, just, I do four times 45. Yeah, just to get to the punchline, I, I think based on the research, the MED is four sessions, 20 minutes, 80 degrees Celsius. Four sessions, 
times 20 minutes, 80 at, degrees Celsius. Yep. Oh, you Fahrenheit. What's the conversion there? I should be better. Uh, it's about should, 175 Fahrenheit. 175 Fahrenheit. Got it. Dry, wet. There's Is much there? more literature on dry. You know, I, was, I actually had a call with a patient this morning and this topic of saunas came up and she asked if she could substitute steam rooms and such. And I said, we just don't know because we don't have the data. Um, so the, you know, the precautionary principle would say if you have access to a dry sauna, that's where we have reams and reams and reams of data. So it's probably where it goes. But look, if you think about what the mechanism of action is. Yeah, I was going to ask you next. Is it heat shock proteins? Is it something else? I think it's many things. I think it's heat shock proteins. I think it's nitric oxide. I think it's like literally vascular tone, right? Reduction in blood pressure. Um, it's an you know, increase in heart rate and cardiac output. So there's a bit of an exercise benefit. Um, I don't know if BDNF, I think BDNF has been measured. I can't recall. That could be another uh, potential benefit. So brain, my guess is it's BDNF more, brain derived neurotrophic factor. factor. Yeah. I think it's probably half a dozen things that are all moving in the right direction. Um, it's funny when I have done some sauna ing, I've done lactate checks in there to see if it gets me to la zone two. It's not, so it's not a pure exercise mimetic because it doesn't even get me to the level of a zone two workout. Um, at least when it comes to a pure, you know, ADP, ATP uptake or ATP production standpoint. Hmm. But yeah, I've become like really optimistic on this. And I think it's, uh, I think it's very promising. And I think it's, again, it's the challenge is, is how scalable is it, right? Like it's not as, it's not that easy to do. I would imagine also contraindicated for a lot of folks. I mean, yeah. Depending. Yeah. I suspect, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're really far down the line of your health is, is suffering and you're, yeah. you know, particularly old or something like that, or your heart's a little more frail. Yeah. This would, this might push you a little bit beyond. So again, it speaks to sort of prevention and, and hopefully with COVID kind of winding its way down and enough people getting vaccinated, people can get back to gyms where saunas are and things like that. Yeah. Amazing. Preferred method for zone two training. seems like you do most of your work on a bike. I do. I like the bike. It's just my body is so much more efficient on a bike than anything else. Do you have a preferred stationary bike or do you? Yeah, I, I do. I ride my bike, like my road bike on something called a Wahoo kicker. Wahoo kicker. Which is awesome. Like hands down. If someone sweet. doesn't have a road bike. Then I, my favorite stationary bike is the Kaiser. K-A-I-S-E-R? Yeah. K-A-I-S-E-R, I believe. And I think Kaiser makes such a fantastic uh, spin bike. Amazing. You want to do one more change your mind about or one more excited? You can uh, dealer's choice. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about GLP-1 agonists. Tell, tell, me too. I don't even know what that means. Tell me, Peter. All right. So GLP-1 agonist, glucagon-like peptide 1. They also go by GLP-1-RAs. So glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist. Agonists. Okay, so glucagon is a hormone. It's made by the liver, sort of opposes the action of insulin. It's a, um, it's a hormone that um, produces satiety um, and uh, can regulate blood glucose levels. So regulate, meaning it's catabolic. Lowers, lowers blood glucose. Lowers yeah. blood it, it glucose. secretes insulin, actually. It results in secretion of insulin to lower blood glucose. So Got it. these are a group of drugs that have been around for quite some time. Also, uh, kind of a, uh, a high choice in people with type 2 diabetes. Um, a trial came out, I want to say 2014, showing that one of these drugs was actually also pretty good for weight loss in non-diabetics. Hmm. It didn't get a lot of traction. The effect size was was reasonable, but it wasn't great. I looked at it quite a bit because I remember at the time I had a patient who whose weight was really recalcitrant. It just wasn't clear what it was going to take to get her to help help her lose weight. And I certainly am not a fan of stimulants for weight loss. Um, you know, drugs like fentermine can be somewhat effective, but they can also have their side effects and be somewhat habit forming. And we had sort of noodled this and, and eventually we ended up trying this drug. It didn't really have that much of an effect. And I, I kind of sort of put it aside for a while, um, until about six or seven months ago, I was talking to someone who had an early line of sight into a trial 
that was going to be published. And they said, you know, they'd been using it clinically, a newer version of this drug. Um, it's called semaglutide. The um, trade name is Ozempic. Um, and they said, yeah, you've got to see what this drug can do. Like, so the drug, the dose that's given for people with diabetes is one milligram once a week. So it's an injectable drug. So it's, it comes in a little pen. You, you know, shoot it in your gut or your leg once a week, one milligram. intramuscular or uh, subcutaneous? Sub 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 yeah, yeah, tiny, tiny little insulin syringe. And he said, yeah, but when we push people up to two and a half milligrams, the weight loss is comical. Like, and th this is not, this is not just people with diabetes. This is anybody. And then sure enough, there was a study that was published um, probably a couple of months ago looking at semaglutide in overweight and obese people without diabetes. And the weight loss was through the moon. I mean, it was, you know, we're talking like 20% weight loss. Holy shit. Um, completely durable <laughs> as long as you're on the drug. So then it yeah. begs the question, what happens when you come off the drug? Um, we haven't seen fully what that looks like yet. I mean, I think we need to see what those studies look like. I mean, my, my thinking of this, we've now put a lot of patients on this drug. Uh, I mean, a lot is relative, but, you know, maybe, maybe 12, 15 patients we've put on this drug. Some people can't tolerate it because of the nausea. So nausea. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely one of the side How effects. How often is it administered? Once a week. Once a week. Uh, is the nausea transient or is it yeah, it tends to fluctuate how far you weigh. Are, you are, so if you inject it on a Sunday and then, you know, usually by the next Saturday, the symptoms are gone. But then when you hit yourself on that Sunday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you'll be a bit more nauseous. Now, again, that's so it's transient across the week, but it also yeah. seems to be transient over time. So the, the dose in the study was 2.4 milligrams. So, you know, two and a half times higher than you're doing it in people with type 2 diabetes. But um you don't start people at that dose. You'll start them at half a milligram for a few weeks, then one milligram, then one and a half, then two, et cetera. Um, but basically we haven't seen any patient who can tolerate the drug that does not lose weight. Hmm. Um, have, have any cycled off in which case, I mean, obviously behavior matters a lot and <laughs> calories matter a lot, but yep. do you see a greater no, I don't, you would no. anticipate otherwise. And they don't seem to regain all the weight they lost. Now, my biggest concern, and it, I mean, it was, I was so fascinated by this uh, before the study came out. We actually did a whole journal club just on this study and went like stupidly nerdy on this drug. Um, the biggest concern I would have is, is a drug that lowers glucose but raises insulin such a good idea? Mm, yeah. um, and also, it flies in the face of how you would lose weight in that situation, right? It, it seems to not be entirely clear why would that result in weight loss unless the increase in insulin along with the glucagon-like peptide are reducing appetite. But what we've discovered in experimenting with a lot of our patients, by experimenting, I mean just doing a lot of blood tests before and after, is while it probably slightly increases your fasting insulin level, it's also clearly increasing muscle insulin sensitivity because postprandial insulin levels seem to be down. And I would bet, though it was not done in this study. Postprandial meaning post meal. After meal. I would bet that if they had looked at 24 hour insulin secretion, which you can do by collecting 24 hours of urine and measuring C peptide, mm. which is. I didn't know it that. exists in a one-to-one -one ratio with insulin because when insulin comes out, it's a pro-hormone and then it gets cleaved into insulin and C-peptide. So you should have one C-peptide for every insulin. So if you measure the urinary amount of C-peptide, you know how much insulin was secreted. I'm really disappointed that study didn't do that, but my guess would be that they saw 24-hour C-peptide go down even as resting insulin went up. Okay, which would mean, and well please correct me if I'm oversimplifying this, but that on, if you look at the average, it is not net net leading you to increased insulin levels. That's right. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Th I, this drug is currently- Have you seen 20%? Now, when you say 20% reductions, are we talking about body fat or body weight or- Body weight. Wow. Yeah. Total body weight. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, that's, and that's easy. There, you'll you'll see in, more. Yeah, these They're are in not, obese people? Yeah, we've even put it, we've even had patients who are not even, wouldn't be classified as obese, just slightly overweight. You know, a 200 pound person that in three months is 180 pounds and effortlessly at 180 pounds, right? Wow. Like they've literally reduced their appetite. 
um, and they've improved their insulin sensitivity and glucose disposal. And that's where other interventions failed. So it's it's not. I mean, I I know that we're not blinding this or anything with patients, but you don't think that that is, you you attribute that predominantly to this this drug, not to say changes in eating or other habits. Well, they have changed their eating, but I think it's in response to the drug. Ah, uh, yeah, right. So I think the drug is working centrally, peripherally. I think it's working on the fat cells. I think it's working on their brain. I think it's working on their muscles. I think it's doing a lot of things. Mm. And it's still early days, but I mean, this is a promising drug, in my opinion. Um, you know, I look, I think, I think there are, there, there's, there's some people who think that you shouldn't need a drug to help you. And like, if you need a drug to lose weight, you're somehow a bad person or something like that. But, you know, I just, I just think categorically, that's just such a, a simple minded view of the world, right? Like, we live in a world with technology. And just as you don't rub two sticks together when you want to have a fire, if a Zippo lighter is available to you, um, you know, if you have tried every dietary strategy imaginable and your metabolism is not, you know, moving in the right direction, why shouldn't we explore other ways to kickstart that? And the other thing, by the way, is I think you can take these things for a few months, come off them and see if you have formed new habits in the interim. Um, I also think there'll be in my mind, a model for cycling. Three months on, three months off, three months on, three months off. Again, we wanna make sure that that doesn't cause some recalcitrance to the medication or something like that. Um, I, I think this is exciting. I think this warrants a lot more follow-up. Um, but what it's saying is that things that improve diabetes also improve health. Hmm. And nothing does that more than exercise and nutrition. That's the reality of it. But not everybody can do enough exercise and the right nutrition with enough ease to get the benefits. So the more tools we have in our toolkit that go outside of that, the better. Dig it. Peter, always so fun to hang. And I want to underscore to me how exciting and interesting it is for people listening uh, to strive to increase their scientific literacy. And you have your series of articles, which we'll put in the show notes. Uh, there's a book that I enjoyed tremendously called Bad Science by Ben Goldacre, who I believe is an MD, uh, and uh, enjoyed that so much that had a, a, a few excerpts from that book put into the appendix or the appendices of For Our Body, uh, because I wanted to provide some basics. Are there any other resources or recommendations for folks who want to improve their ability to separate fact from fiction, hype from reality when it comes to headlines, media, studies, and so on. I mean, not, not to get to Peter Atiyah level, but to get to the point where they just have a better ability to separate signal from noise with this kind of thing. You know, there's a good newsletter that I subscribe to out of the University of Indiana. Um, it's called the, I think it's called metabolomics and energetics or metabolism and energetics. It's like a weekly newsletter that comes out on Fridays and it's, you know, it's pretty detailed, but one of the sections is always headline versus study. Oh, that's and that's, great. that's always a cute one. Cause every week you get to see, they just pick one example because of course there's a billion examples every yeah. week of how the headline says something and it turns out to have nothing in common with the study. Now that's not exactly the question you've asked, but it is a good illustration of just how Basically, just because you, if you read something in the media, it's, you should just assume it's, in, it's, it's being taken out of context and it's incorrect. Um, and unfortunately, I, I wish I had better answers on. Well, it'd be like if you saw a headline that said, eating nubbins increases risk of colorectal cancer by 100%. But if the chance is one in 10 billion people and it goes to two in 10 billion people, it's doesn't, a great, doesn't mean you should pay attention to that's it. That's right. And that's not a great to discredit your nubbin. And, and, but that's a great example of always knowing absolute risk versus relative risk. That's exactly, yeah. that's exactly like the kind of stuff we talk about in studying studies is yeah. never pay attention to relative risk without knowing absolute risk as well and things like that. So, yeah, Peter, I think it might be time for us to prepare for our uh, prandial adventure. <laughs> That's probably not the way you use it. <laughs> to have our meal, uh, to have our, <laughs> to have our, our preprandial our, exploration, our preprandial exploration of uh, various various cacti. Is, is agave considered a cacti? Well, I guess what is mezcal actually made from? Is it agave? Um, I know well, it's like a campfire in your mouth. 
but that doesn't tell us much about yeah, the botanical know. origins. I know Satol is different. Have you had Satol as a no. side note? It's a plant, or I should say it's a be- also, it's a beverage. Maybe it isn't a plant, but it's only found in a few parts of Texas and Mexico. And it's sort of in between tequila and mezcal. Speaking of Texas, can I tell you the only thing so far about Texas I'm not fond of? Uh, scorpions in your kitchen? I, eh, they, they, <laughs> I've only that, found that six. Was, that was this morning in yeah. my household. We took care of it. It was fine. Um, it's the cactuses when I'm out in the bush. Mm. So when I was out, what are you doing out in the bush? Well, when I was out doing that precision <laughs> shooting uh, a couple months ago, <laughs> yes, right. they were like training they, for your counter sniper operation. That's right. So we had like mats down <laughs> on the ground and we're laying on our mats and we're, you know, shooting off into the distance. And I, I vaguely remember someone saying, stay on your mat. Oh God. Oh, and, God. um, <laughs> so at one point I'm like loading my magazine and I kind of rolled off the mat oh. and you know, loaded it and, and was shooting. And then like that day we're driving home and I'm like, God, why does my butt hurt so much? And why does my leg hurt so much? And, you know, by the time I got home, I realized I was just full of these little micro needles <laughs> and, you know, it went through my pants and everything. And I mean, this is how, you know, your wife really loves you because like I had to give her a set of tweezers to literally start yanking these needles out of my butt and my leg. And <laughs> I actually still have some there. Three months later, I still I can still feel some of the ones that broke beneath it. And and so I'm going on this hunt in um about three weeks. And it's my I mean, first time hunting axis deer here in Texas. And one of the things that the guy who's taking me said is you you gotta make sure your shoes uh won't get poked like the cactuses won't you're, go through your boots. So you're not gonna wear your ninja socks for this one? Yeah, no, this will not be a barefoot hunt. <laughs> But aside from the cactuses, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All good in the Republic of Texas. I have a shirt. Maybe I'll get you one of these. You might have seen it. It says, has a has a big flag, Texan flag on it. It says, most likely to secede. Yeah. <laughs> they sell those at the airport in Austin for those who are interested. Uh, well, Peter, off to dinner we go. Thanks again. Is there anything that you would like to mention before we close? Of course, people can find you. Peter Atia MD will basically take them to everything, I would imagine. That's the website, that's Twitter, it's Instagram, Facebook, also YouTube. So you've been very consistent with uh, how people can reach you. The podcast is The Drive, which, as mentioned, is a weekly deep dive podcast focusing on uh, all of the nerdy subjects that I find so fascinating that Peter and his guests know so much about. Anything you'd like to add to that? I mean, I would just say that some decaffeinated brands of coffee are just as tasty as the real thing. You know what the reference is? What movie is that from? I don't get the reference. What, what is that? Is that real genius? I think it's real genius. Oh, is that real genius? I think so, yeah. You know, I'll give you a bit of Austin trivia. Uh, we're going all over the show here. But uh, there is a food truck here in Austin, which I had been told by a former professional tennis player i had to try it had the best chicken wings and for me the chicken wings in general are kind of like the uh the pistachios of the fowl family they're just so much work and you just don't get much out of it turns out tommy want wingy which is the name of this food truck has incredible chicken wings they're delicious i don't know what anabolics they give these chickens but they're enormous Uh, you can have a full meal and tommy want wingy where is he? Part? Tommy Want Wingy. Do you know he's he's actually at uh, I think it's Cosmic Cafe. They may have multiple locations. Do you know what reference Tommy Want Wingy is from? Well, it's not the Donger Need Food. So that's sixteen <laughs> candles. <laughs> Tommy Boy, Chris Farley, Tommy Want Wingy, the diner scene. It's funny. I've seen that movie a hundred times. How have I missed that? Oh yeah, yeah. Where he's talking about his his sales process and he convinces them to the the waitress to fire up the kitchen after they've closed and he grabs i think it's like a muffin and he's like let's say that's my prospect and he walks through this entire thing we'll link <laughs> we'll link to this video <laughs> in the show notes so that for for people who want us Fantastic. to get chris farley plus zone two training plus rapamycin in one place this is probably the only site on the internet that will have all of those in one set of show notes Perfect. and uh peter thanks for taking the time man thanks man Could you just briefly 
explain what efficiency means within the aerobic efficiency and then come back to the zone two training? Yeah, it comes down to basically substrate usage. So in um, in aerobic activity, um, you can use glucose or fat. Those are basically the two fuels that um, the body with oxygen can turn into ATP. So aerobic, most people will recognize means with oxygen and anaerobic means without oxygen. So when you're not demanding much energy of yourself, and energy of course we talk about is ATP. So ATP is the currency for energy. Um, when your body isn't demanding much energy, you can make ATP using glucose or using fatty acids. And it's a similar process, but obviously different because they're different molecules. So glucose gets turned into something called pyruvate. And that happens in the cell, but outside of the mitochondria. And then the pyruvate gets shuttled into the mitochondria where it undergoes a process uh, known as the electron transport chain, where a whole bunch of chemical reactions occur that basically generate a gradient of electrons in the inner membrane of the mitochondria that's ultimately used um, to produce carbon dioxide and water and a boatload of ATP. With fatty acids, it's a little different. Uh, fatty acids get broken down into smaller chunks of fatty acids that have two carbons called acetyl-CoA, and the acetyl-CoAs get fed into the mitochondria and undergo the same sort of process. So um, what's nice about that is you have the ability to use both fuels. But when energy demands start to climb, so when you are asking more of yourself, when you're now running or when you're walking up a flight of stairs or doing anything that now the body's saying, hey, I need more and more ATP, that glucose system is the first one to cave. So the glucose system, when you turn the glucose into pyruvate, it basically says, I don't have enough oxygen to run this through the mitochondria to do what I need. I'm going to instead turn pyruvate into lactate, which yields some ATP, but a pittance compared to what it could do. So, you know, pyruvate into lactate will generate one sixteenth the ATP that it would if it went into the Krebs cycle, which is horrible, but it's like any port in a storm, right? It's like, I don't have a choice. As a, as a side note, Everybody tends to think that lactate is what causes the soreness when you're doing that. It's, it's actually not the lactate. It's, hydrogen? it's the hydrogen ion that accompanies the, the, the lactate because lactate is acidic. So you don't actually feel anything from the lactate. And lactate itself is actually a pretty remarkable fuel. The brain, there's emerging evidence that the brain actually likes lactate as a fuel and the liver can turn it back into glucose pretty easily. But nevertheless, it's inefficient right? It's a horrible way to turn your hydrocarbon into ATP. Um, and it does come with this problem of being self-limited. So the efficiency speaks to the longer you can use the mitochondria, the better. And this zone two characteristic is really one of the most remarkable ways to separate and differentiate people with different degrees of metabolic efficiency. So um, Inigo San Milan and George Brooks did a study that I talked about at length in one of the AMAs. Did you say Caesar Milan? No, I'm kidding. Oh. <laughs> the dog trainer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what were the names again? Inigo, oh, okay. San Milan, and George Brooks. Got it. Uh, Inigo's been a guest on my podcast as well. They did a study looking at three cohorts of people, professional cyclists, fit people, and people with type 2 diabetes. Just real quick, how did they define fit? Um, I don't remember exactly, but it would be like people who exercise a certain number of hours a week who were pretty fit. These were people mm -hmm. that were probably exercising 10 hours a week or something to that mm -hmm. effect. Um, so, so not just kind of yeah, like weekend work. 10, 10 work. hours a week is non trivial. No, yeah. no, not at all. Right. And what they looked at was what were their lactate curves um, on a bicycle? And at what point did they reach that two millimole level? And, you know, it's just a staggering difference. Um, so all of them would ultimately achieve high lactates, admittedly very different powers, right? The fitter you are, the more power you generate before you hit that peak lactate. The people with type two diabetes were reaching this critical threshold at something in the vicinity of 80 to 100 watts. Um, so 80 to 100 watts on a bike, if you don't know what that feels like, um, 
it's hard to explain what that would, I, I wish I had a good conversion for what that feels like. Uh, that's not a lot of effort. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I guess for someone who spends any flat time on ground, a ground, slight incline. Yeah. Flat ground, no wind going 13 or 14 miles an hour. Got it. Uh, maybe less. Um, which amounts to about 1.2 watts per kilo, because you always want to normalize these things to body weight. So 1.2 watts per kilo, one watt per kilo in that vicinity. The, the reasonably well-trained average, you know, not average, the reasonably well-trained person um, was hitting that number at closer to 150 to 170 watts, uh, putting them pretty comfortably in about the 1.7, 1.8 watt per kilo range. So, you know, significantly higher than people with type 2 diabetes. And the professional cyclists were hitting that mark in the vicinity of 320 to 360 watts. And of course, they're even lighter. So they're hitting that number at a staggering four watts per kilo. What was the total duration of the assessment? It's typically done, you, you know, unlike a ramp test where you're quickly, quickly changing, you, you typically do long ramps. So you know, 15 minutes, check lactate, 15 minutes, check lactate, or 10 minutes would be about the minimum. Do you think those results would have looked different had the muscle groups involved been different? Had it been uh, like a hand bike or something like that? I guess I'm wondering if there's any localized effect just given the training of the cyclists. Yeah, it's possible. Um, and, and certainly there's a, you know, there's an efficiency that comes from doing the thing that you're being tested on typically lower body exercises are the way to do this because we have so much muscle mass there when we have patients do their zone two we basically recommend three things you know a bike a rowing machine or a treadmill are probably the best ways to to get that and it doesn't have to be running i mean when i now, do to get you mean to assess or to also train both both yeah because it does need to be pretty steady state mm -hmm. so you know hiking up and down steep climbs tends to not be a great form of training for this. That's another type of training. But when you're coming in and out and in and out of zone two, it's not the same as sort of planting yourself there, staying there and forcing your mitochondria to adapt to it. That was actually going to be my next question. So what is the adaptation that one hopes for? Like what is actually happening to the body when you do effective zone two training? So you're increasing the ability of the mitochondria to utilize the substrate. You're increasing the ability of the muscle to actually take in more oxygen. So um, it's really funny when you compare a really fit person to a really unfit person. And uh, so think about something like a VO2 max test. Um, everybody's breathing the same amount of oxygen. So let's imagine for a moment that you are, you know, the fittest guy in the world and I am not. We're both sitting in this room. We're both breathing in 21% oxygen. If you then put us on a bike and make us go as hard as possible and measure how much oxygen is coming out, you'll notice that much less oxygen is coming out of you than me. So the difference is you're able to use more oxygen than I am. And that is probably not um, mediated at the level of your lungs. That's probably more mediated at the level of your muscles. Now, there may be some differences in the lung as well. This is not an entirely settled question, but there's undoubtedly a bigger delta at the muscles. So that's a big part of it, is simply being able to utilize more oxygen. Um, the other thing is perhaps increasing the density of mitochondria. So simply having more mitochondria in the muscle will allow for more of that substrate to enter the mitochondria versus outside. And then, of course, there are transporters. Um, and the transporters determine a little bit of how the body can sort of utilize lactate, keep it in the cell versus recycle it and get it out of the cell quicker. From a training standpoint, the good news is all of this stuff is trainable, um, but it does require deliberate form of training. And one thing I don't think we know yet, but it's looking like the minimum effective dose is probably about three hours a week. Um, three I, hours per yeah ideally delivered at sort of 45 to 60 minute intervals um, i've asked inigo about this specifically you know would would just as a thought experiment would doing a whole bunch of 15 minute sets a week be sufficient his view is it would not be that it probably needs to be at least 45 minutes per session so you could do say four i do 445s uh these days 
um, as my zone two protocol. Um, at times I've done more. There's times I'm doing four 60 minute sessions a week. And those should feel, if I'm remembering correctly from what you said earlier, those should not feel agonizing. No. But these should be kind of sustained all day hike type of i know the hike isn't exactly yeah, yeah, perfect yeah. but assuming it's it's a say flat ground constant load this this should be something you could sustain for much longer than say 45 minutes that's right and the not all of our, not all of our patients want to use a, a lactate test so i lactate test myself every time i do a zone two test so <laughs> i have so unlike you peter right right right. so for three <laughs> years i have every session i've ever done recorded by power heart rate lactate all of that stuff because you do see variation by the way so a given power doesn't always keep me at the same zone too so how well i slept the night before my state of hydration what i've eaten will all impact this but how I are you ball tracking ball. whether you are in zone two or not by poking my finger by and see, yep i'm using that okay so when people don't want to do that what do we recommend well we recommend figuring out what your zone two heart rate is because you can track heart rate really easily so rectal probe most of the time <laughs> exactly no that's for temperature so um so heart rate depends on how long it is right so hot yeah <laughs> just sitting right there on the vena cave um so you know with with heart rate you want to give somebody a starting point so so one option is you tell people to do a little bit of lactate testing maybe test yourself once a month figure out what your heart rate is and then going forward just rely on heart rate for people who never ever ever want to poke themselves or just are insulted by how expensive these stupid things are which they are really stupidly expensive like the lactate meter is 250 bucks but the strips are four dollars a piece so <laughs> nice. which is just so <laughs> aggravating because you know these things cost about 12 cents to make um we usually use two ways of estimating one estimate is 180 minus your age which i think is the low estimate um right so a 50 year old would you'd start them at about 130 130 what beats per minute beats per minute another way to estimate it is if you know your maximum heart rate so this is usually for people who exercise quite a bit with a heart rate monitor and they know what their true maximum heart rate is um, so let's say a person's out there and they can say, they say, you know what, I can achieve 178 beats per minute just before I feel like I'm going to keel over. That's your max heart rate. I usually start people at about 78% of max heart rate. Now, again, the next thing we layer on that is the sort of the litmus test of how do you feel? Are you able to almost carry out a conversation when you're doing the activity? And the answer should be, yes but i don't really want to that's that's about the sweet spot so it's like a it's a strained conversation but you could do it yeah like yesterday i was doing my zone two and my dad called and i'd missed a bunch of his calls normally i don't answer the phone when i'm on the bike because i have a fan that is blowing air on me so much and it's so noisy but i answered the phone anyway so you know i talked to my dad for five minutes which mostly meant i let him talk and i was kind of like grunting a little bit yeah uh-huh yeah okay yeah uh-huh 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 but I wouldn't want to do this on my bike for a zone two. Like this yeah. would be a bit more than I'd want to do. And if you can't talk at all, which you wouldn't be able to talk, of course, if you're doing like a zone five, uh, then, you know, you're obviously going too hard. And the, the long-term benefit, just to reiterate, the long-term benefit of doing zone two training for say a minimum uh, effective dose of three hours per week is what and when can someone expect to start to see adaptations that are beneficial well the latter is a good question because it probably depends on from where you start right so um <clears throat> you know with with someone who's starting out really metabolically broken which by definition is what type 2 diabetes is that's the most extreme example we have of completely broken metabolism right so a complete inability to partition fuel um, almost a complete inability to burn fatty acids which again gets back to your question about efficiency. An efficient engine should be able to run on two fuels. It should be able to run on glucose and it should be able to run on fat. A broken engine can only run on the short-term fuel, which is glucose. And that's a, that's a brutal cycle to be in, right? If you can only run on glucose, you're, you're, in, you're gonna be in a tough situation because we can store such a tiny amount of glucose relative to fat um, and you're gonna be at the mercy of fluctuating glucose levels constantly whereas if you can rely on fat you're better off 
I've seen um, people make adaptations to this. Um, you know, I would I would usually say it takes three to six months to start to see some adaptations. Um, I guess over the past two and a half years, my zone two power has gone up by 25%. Power measured by, in by watts. watts. Yeah. And to be honest, it's still below what it was nine years ago or seven years ago when I was training as a cyclist. So even though I didn't think of this type of training as a cyclist, I would do these types of workouts as an important part of my overall training. And I was just infinitely fitter back then. So my zone two back then was, I mean, probably 40 watts higher than it is now. Although my zone two is probably 40 watts higher now than it was two and a half years ago. Hmm. 